Okay. Good evening, all of you, and uh, a warm welcome to this important session of uh, radiology revision. And uh, you know, this is for all the upcoming exams, and uh, the whole intention in this uh, video will be to see we have a quick revision of all the important images, all the important topics relevant for your exams that you need to know. And uh, this is mainly directed towards all the students who must have done radiology before. And uh, if you haven't done radiology, you can always, you know, look into our detailed lectures that we are available at Doc Tutorials app. But uh, this whole idea is to give a crisp revision just close to your exams. And I hope you will find this video very, very useful and productive for your revision. Okay, so let's get started. And uh, a lot of questions that I'll be, you know, posting to you so that uh, you are uh, engaged in the class. And also I'll try to cover up a lot of uh, theory that you need to know for, I mean, that you must have studied by now. Let's, so be very interactive. Can you hear me all of you? Uh, I think uh, all of you, I'm looking at your chat also. So please be interactive. Is the voice clear all of you? Yeah, just give me a quick yes if you can hear my voice clearly. Hello, Bhavya, Manish and uh, Abukar, right? So hope uh, you all are good. So let's get started. So we'll go chapter wise, okay? I'll show you chapter wise so that you know when you're going for the revision, you know what all we have touched upon, right? Hello, Kishore, Saradi, right? So let's get started. Let's begin with some very important MCQs of, uh, you know, introduction of radiology, right? Let's get started. Let me see if you can answer this question. Let's get with the first one. A seven week pregnant lady underwent a chest radiograph by mistake. What is to be done? Do we immediately terminate the pregnancy, do pre-invasive test, do chromosomal testing or continue the pregnancy? What do you think we should be doing? Waiting for your answers. Roy, Shaktivel, Kunika, what do you think should be the thing? Answer for this. Uh, continue the pregnancy yes so everybody is right here so good so we have to give a reassurance and continue the pregnancy remember the radiation exposure required to cause fetal damage is very high almost five rats which is not usually done with most diagnostic modalities so even when you're doing CT scan or, or you know when you're going for CT pelvis also you don't have radiation exposure to a level which can cause teratogenicity so you generally avoid giving radiation but in case accidental exposure happens, you need not worry. You just reassure the mother that nothing will happen. Don't worry and uh, continue the pregnancy. Okay, so please remember that. Now, next one. What about this machine? What do you think is this uh, machine showing you? Is it what, what uh, investigation is being done by this machine? You can tell me this. This is mammography, right? So this is mammography. How do you identify this mammography machine? You have this compression plates, right? So the breast is compressed using this compression plates and the images are obtained. Uh, can you tell me what is the age for routine screening of uh, breast cancers? At what age do you go for routine screening of breast cancer? Routine screening of breast cancer. Good. Good. Pandit and uh, Roy, Mahek, Rishi, Konika, right? So, you know, so that's the correct answer. But what is the age group when we go for a routine screening? Remember, routine screening is done by mammography. The routine screening should start, right? As per you know, American College of Surgeons and Breast Cancer Society, above the age of 45 years, above the age of 45 years. But according to American College of Radiology, it can start above the age of 40 years. So this is for routine screening. So routine screening of breast cancer should be done by mammography. Above, in a female, above 45 years, you should go for a routine screening. And what do we use? Do we use 2D mammography or a 3D mammography? Do you want to go for 2D mammography or a 3D mammography? Please remember, a 3D mammography is preferred over 2D mammography for routine screening. And what is the technique used in 3D mammography? The development that has happened in 3D mammography is a digital tomosynthesis. Digital tomosynthesis. So where the x-ray tube moves around the breast 
to take multiple images for better evaluation of the lesion. So please remember digital tomosynthesis uh, update that is seen in mammography. Okay, digital tomosynthesis is an advancement in mammography, which and we prefer 3D mammography over 2D mammography for evaluation of protein screening of breast cancers. Okay, so this is about mammography. Now let's come to the next image. Can you tell me what is this investigation, guys? What is this investigation? Is it a CT scan, MRI, PET scan or uh, any other investigation it comes to your mind by looking at this image? What do you think is this image? Fast. What do you think? Waiting for your answers. So, yes, this is a bone scan. Okay, this is a bone scan. Good. Sunny Asi. So bone scan, what is isotope used in bone scan? This is technetium 99M MDP. What is MDP? Methylene diphosphonate. Methylene diphosphonate. And what is it used for? It basically looks at osteoblastic activities. Osteoblastic activity. So bone scan, osteoblastic activity will be a hot area. So, remember this concept. Don't remember it as metastasis only like that. Okay, just remember any osteoblastic activity will be a hot uptake on a bone scan. So, it could be a osteoblastic mets like in prostate metastasis that we have. Osteoblastic mets or prostate metastasis. Yes, that can give you a hot uptake on bone scan. It can be patient with fibrous dysplasia which can have a hot uptake. Remember fibrous dysplasia is proliferation of bone and bone or spongy bone. There is proliferation, there is osteoblastic activity. Even fibrous dysplasia is a hot uptake. Hot uptake can be seen in osteoarthritis. Remember there is subchondral sclerosis, right? There is subchondral sclerosis. So hot uptake can also be seen in case of osteoarthritis. Even in osteomyelitis, osteomyelitis will have a hot uptake. Even in osteomyelitis, we have involucrum, new bone formation, right? The involucrum is nothing but new bone formation. So, whenever you have osteoblastic activity, it will be hot uptake on bone scan. In osteomyelitis, the three-phase bone scan will be positive. Three-phase bone scan will be positive. In all the three phases, the blood flow phase, blood pool phase, delayed phase, in all the three phases, there will be a increased uptake in that area of osteomyelitis that is called as three-phase bone scan that is positive in osteomyelitis. One more thing, how to differentiate a bone scan from a PET scan? Please remember, look at the uptake in the brain. Remember, PET uses glucose. So, glucose will be taken up by neurons, right? So, ATFDG would go into the brain. But if you see no uptake in the brain, this is not PET scan. This is a bone scan that you have, okay? So, you can see these hot areas. And this all talks about the osteoblastic metastasis that we have. So, look at the uptake in the brain parenchyma to differentiate whether it is a PET scan or a bone scan. Can I ask you, in multiple myeloma, do we do bone scan? In multiple myeloma, do you think bone scan is useful? Bone scan, do we do it or not? Do we do bone scan in multiple myeloma? In multiple myeloma, you know, right, multiple skeletal lesions are there. So, do you think bone scan is useful or not useful? in multiple myeloma. Waiting for your answers. Anybody? Please remember bone scan is not required or not done in multiple myeloma. The reason is in multiple myeloma, what do we have? We all study this. In multiple myeloma, we have osteolytic metastasis, multiple punched out lytic lesions. Multiple punched out lytic lesions we have. So, we don't have blastic lesions, we have lytic lesions. So, because we have lytic lesions, not blastic lesions, getting a bone scan is useless in cases of multiple myeloma. Remember these important points about multiple myeloma. Okay, good. Good Atharva, Konica, serotonin, right? So, let's go to the next one. Okay, can you look at this image now? Now, you tell me, is it a bone scan or a PET scan? What do you think is this? What do you think is this? Is it a bone scan or a PET scan? So, you can see uptake in the neurons, right? Uptake in the brain. So, this is basically 18 FDG that is used, 18 fluorodeoxy glucose that is used. So, this is a PET scan, right? So, this is a PET scan. And here, you can see the bone is white. The skull is appearing very white. 
So whenever the bone is white, whenever the bone, cortical bone is white or very hyperdense and the subcutaneous fat, look at the surrounding fat, the fat is black, the fat is black. This is how you have CT scan. And look here, here you can see there is uptake in the brain and the bones are white. So this is a PET CT. PET CT. So here you have a PET scan, here you have a CT scan coronal section and this is a PET CT. PET scan, this is a functional scan. Nuclear scans are functional scans, right? They just tell you hot areas. They don't give you anatomical detail, functional areas only. They don't give you any anatomical detail. And these have gamma ray studies. These are made up of gamma rays. Whereas CT scan, these are anatomical studies and these basically use as X-rays. And PET CT uses both gamma and X-rays. So PET CT has maximum exposure, maximum radiation exposure because both, right? Gamma rays and X-rays are used and this is a hybrid imaging that we have which will tell you functional details also and anatomical details also. So PET CT has a maximum radiation exposure among all the diagnostic modalities that we have, right? So and in case the bone is black, that would be MRI. So if the cortical bone is dark, okay, or black, that is MRI. And if you see uptake in the brain and the bones are black, that would be PET MRI. So please be careful how to look at PET CT and a PET MRI image. Look at the bone. If the bones are white, it is CT. If the bones are black, it is MRI. Now let's come to the next part in the introduction chapter. We'll go to some important radiation units. In the radiation units, we have some conventional units and some SI units. Remember, the conventional units, they generally start with R. Right? Even Curie is a conventional, C for C conventional unit. Whereas the SI units, they don't start with R. So one thing will help you that, the, you know, the conventional units, they start with R. Other thing, look at absorbed dose as A inside the name. Right? A. So this is absorbed dose. Equivalent and effective doses, they have E. Right? So this is E. So, easy to understand, first one, exposure dose, this is measured in a conventional unit called as Roentgen and the SI unit is Coulombs per kg. Absorbed dose is measured in rad and gray, right? Rad is conventional, gray is SI unit of absorbed dose. Both equivalent and effective dose, they are measured in REM and sievert. REM is the conventional unit and sievert is the SI unit and the conversion is also easy. One gray is equal to 100 rad. And one sievert is equal to 100 rem, right? So this is okay. Coming to radioactivity. Coming to radioactivity, the conventional unit of radioactivity is Curie and the SI unit, okay, the father of radioactivity is Henry Becquerel. On his name, we use this word Becquerel for as a SI unit of radioactivity. So this is about the radiation units, okay? So all of this is about radiation unit. And we have different types of radiation ex doses that we have, exposure dose, absorbed dose, right? Equivalent dose, effective dose. Based on that, right, we have different units. Equivalent dose looks into the type of radiation a person is exposed to. It's based on radiation quality factor quality factor, RQF. An effective dose is based on tissue susceptibility, based on which tissue is getting exposed. So equivalent dose is based on what type of radiation are you getting exposed? Are you getting exposed to alpha rays, x-rays, gamma rays? Effective dose is based on the tissue susceptibility, tissue susceptibility, right? Tissue susceptibility. This is about the effective dose. Now, let's come to the next one. Look at this image. What is this batch that we have, right? This batch is a thermoluminescent dosimeter. Thermoluminescent dosimeter. And what do we use this for? What is this thermoluminescent dosimeter used for? This is used for looking at radiation exposure in occupational workers. In occupational workers. Radiation exposure in occupational workers. We use this TLD batch. And can anybody tell me what is the thickness of the lead apron that we use? Thickness of lead apron that we use in for radiation protection. For radiation protection. What is the thickness that we commonly use? Remember, the most commonly used lead thickness is about 0.5 mm. 0.5 mm. 
this TLT batch is always worn under the chest apron, okay? And uh, this is made up of calcium sulfate dysprosium. The compound is calcium sulfate dysprosium. In Western countries, we also use lithium fluoride to make this TLD batch. And remember, this is red every three months. Red every three months. So these are some important points that you need to remember about the TLD batch. The thickness of the lead apron is a previous question, right? Remember, it is about 0.5 mm. Now come to the next one, the radiation syndromes, acute radiation syndromes. Coming to acute radiation syndromes, these occur when you are exposed to a large dose of radiation. So this do not happen usually in, you know, diagnostic radiology. It occurs when you have some, you know, malfunctioning of the, you know, instruments or you are exposed to you know, nuclear accidents or stuff like that or in cancer treatments when a lot of radiation is given to the patients. So those patients suffer from what are called as acute radiation syndromes. And when you get exposed to more than one or two, two grays, you know your bone marrow is the most radiosensitive tissue. So the first thing that happens are your hematopoietic syndromes. So the onset will be after a few months after exposure, right? So generally the bone marrow is suppressed, but the circulating RBCs and all would be there. So the onset is very late. When you are exposed to more than six to 10 gray, you develop GI syndrome associated with nausea, vomitings, electrolyte imbalance, right? So that would start developing when you get exposed to more than 6 to 10 gray. When you get exposed to more than 20 gray, you develop what is called as CNS and the CVS syndromes. These are earliest in onset. Within few minutes, okay, the patient will have these onset of, you know, convulsions, coma and death. And also, earliest onset will be seen with CNS syndrome and early death, okay? So within few minutes, the onset will be there and the patient dies very quickly also. So early onset and early death is seen with CNS. And remember, your CNS is the most radio-resistant tissue. So bone marrow is most radio-sensitive. And that is the reason you are developing hematopoietic syndrome much earlier. Most radio-sensitive is bone marrow. And most radio-resistant, most radio-resistant is what? What is the most radio-resistant, guys? Can you tell me what is the most radio resistant? Most radio resistant is CNS. And that is the reason you are developing CNS syndrome at a very high dose of more than 20 gray. Right? Okay. Comfortable so far? Right? Let's go to the next one. Then, we will come to what is stochastic effect and what is deterministic effects. So, whenever you are getting exposed to radiation, whenever you are having your patient exposed to radiation, the patient can develop two types of effects. One are called as stochastic effects, one are called as deterministic effects. So either you can develop stochastic effects or deterministic effects. Stochastic effects, these are dose independent. So these do not have any role of the dose. They can occur at low doses, they can occur at high doses, there is no threshold dose. So there is no threshold dose in stochastic effects no threshold dose. Whereas deterministic effects, these are dose dependent. These are dose dependent. So remember D for D. Dose dependent is what? Deterministic. Dose independent are what? Stochastic. They do not occur at low doses. They only occur above a threshold dose. They only occur at high doses above a threshold dose. So these occur above threshold dose. They have a threshold. These occur above a threshold dose. So remember the graph, this is a linear curve, right? You have a straight curve for stochastic effect. This is non-linear. So you have a threshold dose above which the effect will develop. Can you tell me some examples of stochastic effects, which are dose independent, right? They can occur at any dose. They can occur at low dose also, of low dose of radiation exposure also. Can you tell me any good uh, example of stochastic effects? Any examples of stochastic effects you remember? Stochastic effects. Any cancers, mutations, right? right? Chromosomal abnormalities. So anything which is having genetic effect, right? So like mutations, hereditary effects, or chromosomal abnormalities, cancers. These are all what? Stochastic effects. They can occur at low dose also. 
So remember when we are exposed to radiation, right, or head and neck radiation in childhood, you can develop papillary carcinoma of thyroid. So even a low dose can cause it and high dose. There is no relation with the dose. It's not related to the severity in stochastic is not related to dose. Is not related to dose. Right? These are dose independent. Deterministic, on the other hand, are you know somatic effects. These are all on the body, what we develop on the body. Like you have erythema, skin erythema. You develop cat tracts, right? You develop GI syndromes, right? You have uh, CNS syndromes, all of these uh, acute radiation syndromes that you see. Anything that occurs on the body, all the somatic effects are your deterministic effects. So erythema. So when you have low dose, you may just have some redness of the skin. And as you increase the dose, you may have charring of the skin, peeling of the skin. So at high doses, right, severity is related to the dose. Severity is related to dose. Directly proportional. Is directly proportional. To dose in case of deterministic effects. So that is how we have this stochastic effects and deterministic effects. Just listen to this once again. Whenever you get exposed to radiation, you can develop two types of effects on your body. One are called as stochastic effects, where you have involvement of your genetics, right? Where you have involvement of, you know, mutations, cancers developing in your body. And these are dose independent. You can develop them at low dose also. You can develop them at high dose. These are having a linear dose effect curve. And these effects, severity is not related to dose. Even low dose can cause cancer, high dose, it doesn't mean that high dose will have higher grade of cancer, low dose will have, it's a mutation, right? So it is not related to the dose. But deterministic effects are dose dependent. They only occur at high doses. They do not occur at low dose. There is a threshold dose for deterministic effect. Only at higher dose, it will occur above the threshold dose. Any example, which is somatic effects, skin erythema, cataracts, right? All GI syndromes, CNS syndromes, all of them are examples of deterministic. Remember, severity is directly proportional to the dose in deterministic effect. Are you clear with this? Is this clear, all of you? Can we move to the next chapter? Can we go to the ultrasound? Can we look at some ultrasound images? Are you okay with the first part? We talked about radiation units. We talked about, you know, the acute radiation syndromes, the... Uh, radiation effects that we have, right? So let's move to the next one. Coming to ultrasound. So the next chapter we're going to do is ultrasound. Remember, ultrasound is based on pulse echo principle, right? So you send an acoustic pulse and the reflected echo is imaged. So from the transducer of the probe, in the transducer, we have a crystal. What is this crystal? The piezoelectric crystal. And what is this made up of? Piezoelectric crystal. This is made up of lead zirconate titanate. This piezoelectric crystal, this crystal is made up of lead zirconate titanate. It sends the sound waves into the body. It hits the organ and the reflected echo is imaged. So you send an acoustic pulse and the reflected echo is imaged. So you converting the electrical current, the current that goes, right? The electrical current is converted to sound and the sound vice versa is converted into electrical current. This property of converting electrical current into sound waves and converting the sound waves back into electrical current, this is called as piezoelectric effect. So what uses piezoelectric effect? Ultrasound. Pulse echo principle is used in ultrasound, right? And uh, the transducers or the probes, they have this crystal, the piezoelectric crystal made up of lead zirconate titanate and it converts the electrical current to sound and sound waves into back electrical current. This is piezoelectric effect, right? Let's go to the next one. Okay, now let's look at some important concepts in ultrasound. The first and the foremost and frequently asked in the exams is about this procedure called as FAST, which is focused assessment with sonography for trauma. Right? So, anytime we have a patient with blunt trauma abdomen, the first investigation that we do is a FAST or EFAST, where we put the probe in these four places. In FAST, the first place we keep is the sub view. The first place we keep is the sub -zephoid. And what does it look for? It looks for a pericardial because you're putting it in the sub You look, you tilt the probe upwards, you look for a pericardial collection. And the most sensitive for hemoperitoneum, the most sensitive for hemoperitoneum is your right upper quadrant view. So this one, the second one, the right upper quadrant view 
is the most sensitive for hemoperitoneum. The reason is, in the right upper quadrant view, we have the liver, the kidney and the Morrison's pouch. Right? So, the Morrison's pouch is the inferior most portion of the peritoneum. So, whenever we have blunt trauma abdomen, the fluid will first collect in the Morrison's pouch. So, that is the reason the first collection will be in the right upper quadrant or right lumbar whenever we have hemoperitoneum in the Morrison's pouch, the most dependent portion of the peritoneum in a supine portion. So, that is the reason the fluid first collects here. So, the most sensitive for hemoperitoneum is the right upper quadrant or the right lumbar view. The next is the extended fast or the E-fast. Now, what is this extended for E-fast? We, in addition to these views, we also take right and left anterior thoracic views. So, we also take this additional anterior thoracic views. Remember, fast was looking at pericardial collection in the sub view, pericardial collection. It will also look at your hemoperitoneum, right? But E-fast, in addition to these four fast views, is also looking at the thorax. That is, it will also look at pneumothorax. So, if you want to evaluate pneumothorax also in a patient with trauma, E-fast is the investigation that you do, where you also add up the right and left anterior thoracic views. So, that is the difference between fast and E-fast. Fast will not look at pneumothorax. E-fast looks at pneumothorax because it has this anterior thoracic views. Now, when we do E-fast and when we look at normal lung, remember air is hyperechoic. Air is white. Air is white on ultrasound. Air is white on ultrasound. So, anything which is white on ultrasound, we call it hyperechoic, right? Hyperechoic. So, when a normal lung is also filled with air, so it will also appear white and it will be moving during breathing, normal inspiration, expiration. So, this normal movement of the lung during inspiration, expiration, this is called as your seashore sign. So, normal appearance, the normal appearance is called as your seashore sign. So, normal appearance of the lung is the seashore sign. But imagine you have pneumothorax in a patient. So, in a patient of pneumothorax, this is also air, this is also white. But does it move during inspiration expiration? No. So, it will not have the same movements. Only white lines will be there. So, these white lines that you have, this will appear like a barcode or a stratosphere. So, barcode or stratosphere sign is feature of a pneumothorax. Right? So, please remember seashore sign is normal appearance of the lung. The normal lung sliding. Right? So, the normal lung sliding will be there. Right? So, that will give you this shimmering called as a seashore sign. But here in pneumothorax, you will have absent lung sliding. It won't be moving during inspiration, expiration. The lung sliding will be not be there. They will be what is called as absent seashore sign or a barcode sign or stratosphere sign. So, please remember barcode sign or stratosphere sign is feature of pneumothorax. And this point of transition between them, this is called as lung point. Point of transition between the lung sliding and absent lung sliding, the seashore sign and absent seashore sign. This is called as lung point and this is very pathognomic, right? So, this is pathognomic of pneumothorax, right? So, this is pathognomic of pneumothorax. Is this clear all of you? So, seashore sign and barcode sign. And what is fast and e-fast? What is the first view? The subsified view. And what is the most sensitive view for hemoperitoneum? The right upper quadrant view. Is this clear all of you? Shall we move forward? Just let me know if you are comfortable with this. Can we move forward? Okay. Next one is the protocol that we follow in a blunt trauma abdomen. So, whenever we have a blunt trauma abdomen, the first thing that we do is E-fast or fast. And if fast is positive, that means there is hemoperitoneum. If fast is negative, there is no hemoperitoneum or you are not able to evaluate the hemoperitoneum in the patient. What would you do if fast comes positive? What is the next step? You have, to have a patient with trauma, you did fast or e-fast, there is fluid, right? There is fluid in the Morrison's pouch, you call it fast positive. So, this is how the fast positive image would be, right? So, this is how the fast, you are seeing the fluid between the liver and the kidney, this is fast positive, right? So, you are seeing fluid there, the black color fluid there between the liver and the kidney. So, whenever there is fast positive, what is the next thing that we do? The next thing that we do when there is fast positive is we look for the patient's vitals. 
is the patient stable or the patient unstable you look for the blood pressure you look for the pulse rate if the patient is stable what is the next step that we do the next step when the patient is stable when the bp given in the question is you know very normal or the pulse rate is fine in such cases we go for cct to know organ of injury so to know which organ is injured and to plan a proper surgery right to know the organ of injury we go for cct so please remember this thing right so the investigation that we do to know the organ of injury in a patient with blunt trauma abdomen is cct if the patient is unstable obviously we cannot send him to radiology department for getting the contrast studies what we do here when we have a patient who is unstable is get a emergency laparotomy we go for a emergency laparotomy right so this is what we do in a patient with fast blunt trauma abdomen the first investigation the initial investigation is an ultrasound that is fast or e fast and if the patient is fast positive if there is a hemoperitoneum in the patient check for the vitals if the vitals are stable go for cct it will tell you which organ is bleeding is it the liver is it the spleen that is injured and if the vitals are unstable you go for a emergency laparotomy so remember this important flow chart very useful for your exams okay the next one now look at this question try to answer this first question a 25 year old rta patient with bruises over the chest and abdomen right and you have a blood pressure which is 90 by 40 pulse rate which is feeble around 30 per minute what is the next step in the management what would you do ultrasound ncct cct or emergency laparotomy there is a rta patient with bruises over the chest and abdomen the vitals looks to be you know unstable right bp is 90 by 40 pulse rate is uh, 30 what is the next step anybody answer this waiting for your answers what do you think is the correct answer here for this condition Mm. Waiting for your answers, guys. Most of them are telling emergency laparotomy. Uh, please understand, is there any, what is the first thing that I told you? Please remember, this I told you is a very important flow chart. Whenever you have a blunt trauma abdomen, the first thing that we do is an ultrasound. Remember, these are sonography, they are all sonography. You do, there is nowhere in the question, it says that there is, uh, you know, fast positive. So, why do you want to go for, uh, you know, emergency laparotomy? When there are bruises over the abdomen, chest, right, it could be cardiac tamponade, that might have, there could be tension pneumothorax causing circulatory collapse. You will not do just an emergency laparotomy. First thing you have to do is a e fast or a fast. So, the answer is ultrasound. Because e-fast can tell you pneumothorax, it can tell you pericardial collections or if there is hemoperitoneum also, then you can plan. So, do not jump the protocol. Do not jump the protocol. Whenever you have a blunt trauma abdomen, the initial investigation, the first investigation that you have to do is an ultrasound that is fast or e-fast. If, if the fast is positive, if the fast is positive, for example, here I have told you here. So, look at here another question here. RTA patient, there is blunt trauma abdomen. Fast, if it is mentioned as positive, fast is mentioned positive. Imagine fast is given positive. Then they gave BP and they are asking you what is the next step. BP is 130-80, this is stable. What is the next step here? CCT, CCT, right? So here you go for CCT, it tells you organ of injury. It's a stable patient to know organ of injury, to plan proper incision, you go for this. And if the patient is unstable, then you go for emergency because already they told fast is positive. Now, the answer should be emergency laparotomy. So, be very careful. This is a frequently tested high yield topic. Everything about FAST, E-FAST is important. The first view is subsified view. The most sensitive view for hemoperitoneum is right upper quadrant view. What is E-FAST? How it differs from FAST? Right? In E-FAST, we have anterior thoracic views. It tells you about pneumothorax. How do you see pneumothorax on the ultrasound? You see the barcode sign, stratosphere sign, absent lung sliding or absent seashore sign. The lung point is the point of transition between these. And remember this very, very important flow chart, blunt trauma abdomen, please start the initial investigation is an ultrasound that is fast or e-fast. And when the fast is positive, then you check for the vitals. If it is stable, go for CCT. If it is unstable, go for emergency laparotomy. I've given you some questions to help you understand this. Is this all clear all of you? Is it clear all of you? And if this is clear, I want you to answer me one thing. 
if this is clear now imagine i'll give you a scenario imagine i'll give you a scenario there is an rta patient right we did you know the past this is negative initially the blood pressure was 110 by 80 and after one hour again it was 90 by 40 repeat fast was also negative right so there is an rta patient whose initial fast did not show any collection there was no collection in the abdomen we thought it was not having any hemoperitoneum then but the bp initially was fine but started to collapse the bp is falling down what should you suspect when there is fast negative but the bp is constantly falling down in your patient anybody rt patient fast is negative bp is falling very good yashwardhan right so very good please remember an important limitation of fast is it cannot evaluate retroperitoneal hematoma so whenever there is a retroperitoneal hematoma retroperitoneal collections right this is an important you know uh, limitation of fast remember some limitations of fast where fast will not be useful limitations of fast remember fast cannot detect retroperitoneal hematoma it can detect hemoperitoneum but not retroperitoneum retroperitoneal hematoma retroperitoneal hematoma if the patient is stable you can go for ccct if there is unstable again you go for a laparotomy but remember retroperitoneal hematoma cannot be seen on a ultrasound or a fast you need to go for ccct for that even when you have subcutaneous emphysema after trauma on the abdominal wall you cannot get you know the good views air is air will not allow ultrasound beam to go it so when there is subcutaneous emphysema after trauma or when hemoperitoneum is or the fluid is less than 100 ml so if the initial evaluation is done very immediately after trauma they can be negative but repeat fast because after some time when the collection grows more than 100 ml you can pick up on ultrasound so remember when it is fluid is very less in the abdomen less than 100 ml you may not pick up on the ultrasound so these are important limitations of fast and also remember not everything is seen on fast you cannot see bubble injuries diaphragm injuries or mesenteric injuries right so these are not these are all not seen right on fast so keep these in mind when you are dealing with blunt trauma abdomen right please remember you cannot evaluate retroperitoneal hematoma you cannot evaluate when there is air in the abdominal wall the subcutaneous emphysema you cannot evaluate initially when the fluid is very less less than 100 ml or when there is some bowel perforations or mesenteric tears or diaphragm injuries so these are important limitations of fast so this topic is important i have done in detail about it okay so let's go to the next one So now let's quickly look so some important ultrasound images that are repeatedly tested on the exam. First one. Look here. This is an hyperechoic area with a postacoustic shadowing. So whenever you have a shadow, right? S for S. Remember, it is a stone. So whenever we have a shadow, we have a shadow. Shadow is black area, right? So shadow is a black area. So whenever we have a hyperechoic area with a shadow, it is a calculi or a stone. and on color doppler calculi on color doppler they show intermixing of colors this is called as twinkling artifacts this is twinkling artifacts so let me show you can you see this this is a kidney and in the kidney this is the kidney in the kidney you can see this is the calculi you can see the postacoustic shadowing and if i am still in doubt i'll press the color doppler button on the color doppler i will see intermixing of colors and this on color doppler is called as twinkling artifacts so twinkling artifacts occur in renal calculi next this image is a thyroid ultrasound you can see here the right lobe the left lobe and this is the isthmus right the isthmus of the thyroid gland please remember thyroid cancers the tyrads thyroid imaging is done by thyroid ultrasound so tyrads is based on thyroid ultrasound the thyroid imaging reporting and data system for thyroid cancers so you should know how does a thyroid cancer appear how a thyroid cancer appears when you look at an ultrasound it appears black it appears hypoechoic cancer would be hypoechoic it would be taller than white right it will be more tall than white and it will have some areas of calcification within 
So hypoechoic, taller than wide, and areas of calcification. So this is how the cancer appears. So if imagine you are having, you are standing in a queue, and a very tall person is standing behind you, right? You you feel very uncomfortable, right? Very suspicious if a very tall person is standing right behind you. So taller than wide is suspicious for malignancy. Taller than wide is suspicious for malignancy in the thyroid, in the breast. Whenever you see the lesion which is taller than wide, we are worried that it could be a malignant lesion. Okay, so that is important. Now, this is orbital ultrasound and on this orbital ultrasound, you are seeing a V-shape or a funnel-shaped retinal detachment. Can you see here? This is how we have a V-shape or a funnel-shaped retinal detachment, right? So, because the retina is tightly attached to the periphery and as well as to the optic disc at the disc also, right? So, at the optic disc and the periphery, the aura serrata, they are tightly attached. So, the detachment will happen in the middle giving a V-shape or funnel-shaped detachment. So, this is how we have a retinal detachment, okay? So, let me show you the image again. So, when you see such kind of orbital ultrasound showing this retinal detachment, right? So, this is how we have this. Next thing. Then, coming to the next topic, the endoscopic ultrasound. Endoscopic ultrasound is a high-resolution ultrasound which looks at the GI wall. Hello, Lakshay, right? And uh, let's come to the next the next topic, endoscopic ultrasound. Endoscopic ultrasound is a ultrasound which can look at the GI wall in different layers. You can see the mucosa, muscularis mucosa, submucosa, muscularis propria. Wherever we have the word muzzle, wherever we have the word muzzle, the muzzle is hypoechoic. The muzzles are hypoechoic, black. So that is how we know which is the muzzle area, right? So mucosa is white, muscularis mucosa is black. Submucosa is again white, the muscularis propria is black, and serosa is again white. So, hypo means dark, hyper means white on ultrasound. An endoscopic ultrasound is the investigation to look at periampillary cancer. So, imagine this is the duodenum, and this is the ampulla of batter, and this is the pancreas here. If you have a mass here, you have the dilatation of CBD, you have dilatation of the pancreatic duct. The patient will have obstructive jaundice. But this lesion may not be picked up on CT also. Initially, when you are getting a CT scan, you may miss that lesion. Because it's very small, right, and it causes symptoms. When you get an endoscopic ultrasound, when I go with the endoscope, I can easily evaluate this lesion. So, an endoscopic ultrasound is the earliest investigation that can look at periampillary carcinoma, much earlier than CECT. So, the investigation of choice for periampillary carcinoma is a endoscopic ultrasound endoscopic ultrasound okay so keep this in mind and because you can see the gi wall in different layers to look at local invasion of gi cancers look at whether the cancer is an early cancer or advanced cancer anything which has invaded the muscularis propria would be an advanced cancer right so to know whether it is a invading or not to look at local invasion of gi cancers also to look at this involvement of mucosa, muscularis mucosa, right, muscle layer, we go for endoscopic ultrasound. So, these two important things remember for local invasion of GI cancers and the investigation of choice for periampillary carcinoma is endoscopic ultrasound, right. Next. Now, look at these images. These are frequently tested on the exam, very simple images. You are seeing the liver and the gallbladder, some hyperechoic areas with a shadow. This is your cholelithiasis or the gallstones. So, you are seeing the shadows. That means you are having the stones. This is gallstones. Look at this. Here also you can see the liver. This is the liver. This is the gallbladder. This is the gallbladder. And inside the gallbladder, you can see some hyperechoic areas, but you are not seeing any shadow. Instead, you are seeing comet tail artifacts. You're seeing tail like that. You're not seeing a black area. You're seeing comet tail, starry sky like areas, right? A falling star or a comet tail like areas. So, whenever you see comet tail artifacts, can you tell me anybody? Where do you see comet tail artifacts of gallbladder? So, where do, is it not a calculi? A calculi would be on the dependent part. A calculi would show the acoustic shadowing. But where do you see comet tail artifacts of gallbladder? Comet tail artifacts of gallbladder. Anybody? Where do you see comet tail artifacts of gallbladder? Anybody can, anybody remembers it? This is gallbladder adenomyomatosis, adenomyomatosis. Gallbladder adenomyomatosis will have this cometal artifacts, okay? Remember, gallbladder adenomyomatosis. Next, coming to acute cholecystitis, 
how to differentiate acute cholecystitis from chronic cholecystitis. Let us look at these differences. I will show you in this image with the image. Acute cholecystitis, remember what is the investigation of choice of acute cholecystitis? What is the investigation of choice for acute cholecystitis? For most gallbladder pathology it is ultrasound. But if I ask you what is the most sensitive, most sensitive or most accurate, what is it? This is EDA scan. And the important difference between acute cholecystitis and a chronic cholecystitis is in acute there will be gallbladder distension. Whereas in chronicity you have fibrosis, so there will be a shrunken gallbladder. So if you are seeing a distended gallbladder, will wall thickening, right? You can see this is a distended gallbladder, there is a wall thickening. This is acute cholecystitis. When you press with the ultrasound probe, even the sonographic murphies will be positive. The sonographic murphies is also positive in acute cholecystitis. A chronic cholecystitis, the gallbladder is shrunken. Because of fibrosis, the gallbladder is shrunken. And if you have a calculi, there will be a hyperechoic area with a shadow. So you will not see the posterior wall. You will not see the posterior wall. You will only see an anterior wall, the echogenic area and the shadow. This is called as wall echo shadow sign or west sign that is used, that is seen with chronic calcific cholecystitis. A chronic calcific cholecystitis, a chronic calcific cholecystitis will show you this wall echo shadow sign where you see only an anterior wall, the echogenic area of the calculi and the shadow. You will not see the posterior wall. So the difference between acute and chronic is in acute you have GB wall distension. You have a GB wall thickening with a luminal distension. Whereas in chronic there is a shrunken gallbladder and you see this wall echo shadow sign. Wall echo shadow sign. Is this okay? Now let's come to the next one. Instead of stones, if you have cystic areas, like in the breast you have a cyst, in the thyroid you have a cyst, there is a gallbladder, there is a urinary bladder. If you have cystic areas, posterior to that you see this white enhancement. Remember enhancement means white, shadow means black, the shadows are black, right? So posteracoustic shadowing is seen with calculi, posteracoustic enhancement is seen with cystic lesions. So if you are seeing posteracoustic enhancement, this is seen with a cystic lesion. So, postacoustic enhancement is a cystic area. Postacoustic shadowing is seen with a calculi, right? That is about the shadowing and the enhancement part. Next, wall echo shadow sign. Wall echo shadow sign, please remember again, wall echo shadow. This is seen with chronic calcific cholecystitis. Chronic calcific cholecystitis. So basically what happens is there is a chronic condition. So the gallbladder is shrunken. So you have a fibrotic shrunken gallbladder. There is a calcification also. So there is a calcific area inside the gallbladder. And anytime there is a calcification or stone, you will have a shadow. You will have a shadow with it. And because it is a shrunken gallbladder, you will not see the posterior wall. What are you seeing? Only an anterior wall the echogenic area and the shadow. So this is called wall echo shadow sign, wall echo shadow sign. Seen with which condition? Chronic calcific cholecystitis, wall, the anterior wall is seen, the echogenic area of the echo means whitish area, the echogenic area or the white area of the shadow calculi is seen and posterior to any calculi you will see the shadow. So this is wall echo shadow sign. Is it okay cortex? Are you comfortable with this wall echo shadow sign? Right, let's come to the next one. Let's come to the next one. Now, let's come to acute appendicitis. Remember, acute appendicitis, the investigation of choice in a child is graded ultrasound, right? So, we push the bubble loops and slowly do the ultrasound in a child to look at the inflamed appendix. And how does the appendix appear on the ultrasound? You will see a blind ending. You can see here this blind ending tubular structure which is non-compressible, which is aperistaltic, right? So this blind ending tubular structure on longitudinal view, it will appear like this. But if I take a short axis view, short axis view is just I'm taking a transverse view. So it will appear like this, right? So if I turn the probe, so something which is longitudinal, if I turn the probe, it will get a short axis view also. In the short axis view, I get an inflamed bubble wall with the mucosa. So this is the target sign. So both these things, target sign, and a blind ending tubular, aperistaltic, non-compressible structure 
these indicate this is acute appendicitis in that patient. Remember, target sign is a non-specific sign. This is a non-specific sign. It is not just seen with. <coughs> it is not just seen with uh, acute appendicitis. Anything which causes bulb wall thickening will show you this target sign. For example, imagine one minute. Imagine I am having a patient with, you know, pyloric stenosis, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So imagine this is the pyloric wall thickening. If I take a short axis view, the thick pylorus will form the target, right, target sign. So even in idiopathic hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, I can see a target sign. Target sign can see in Crohn's disease where we have transmural inflammation. Target sign will be seen even in, uh, you know, in cases with Crohn's disease where you have transmural inflammation. So anything which causes bulb wall thickening. So for example, you have your uh, uh, intersusception when one bubble is entering into the other bubble. You have illusical tuberculosis where you have thickening of the bubble, right? So anytime you have bulb wall thickening, you can get this target sign. So target sign is a non-specific sign. It can be seen with idiopathic hypertrophic pyloxenosis or Crohn's disease or even cases of appendicitis. Any bulb wall thickening can produce this kind of appearance. Next. Then, where do you see a ring of fire appearance on color Doppler? A ring of fire appearance. A ring of fire appearance talks about a peripheral vascularity like this. A peripheral vascularity on a color Doppler that is called ring of fire appearance. The most common cause is a physiological condition, the corpus luteal cyst. After ovulation, right, that area will also show peripheral vascularity. So the more common cause for ring of fire appearance is a physiological condition, the corpus luteal cyst. And it can also be seen when you have an ectopic pregnancy. In the fallopian tube, when you have an ectopic pregnancy, the placenta is in the periphery of the fallopian tube, then also you can develop this air peripheral vascularity giving a ring of fire appearance. And that is the reason for ectopic pregnancy is important to have elevated HCG along with the adnexal mass showing ring of fire. So just a ring of fire will not be helpful. You have to have elevated HCG, you should have that uh, adnexal mass showing this ring of fire appearance, right? So this is about ectopic pregnancies and uh, corpus luteal cyst. Shakti well, what do you want to differentiate between? If you can be more specific, I can help you with that, right? Next. The next one is snowstorm appearance. This has been a simple one-liner. So when you have enlarged uterus with multiple grape-like cysts, this is snowstorm appearance. This is feature of hylatiform mole or molar pregnancy. This can be a complete mole or this can be a partial mole. Complete mole will be completely grape-like cyst, no fetal parts, no fetal parts. Partial mole will have partially grape-like cyst and partially fetal parts. There will be fetal parts seen in case of partial mole. And which has risk of choriocarcinoma? Which has risk of choriocarcinoma? Which has a risk of choriocarcinoma? Risk of choriocarcinoma, C for C, remember, risk of cancer choriocarcinoma is seen with complete mole. Complete mole will have a risk of choriocarcinoma, right? Next. Coming to a very important topic, the Mickey Mouse appearance. Mickey Mouse appearance on ultrasound thigh. When you are getting the ultrasound thigh, on the ultrasound thigh, we have in the thigh, the femoral artery we have, right? We have a femoral vein and we have a great sapiness vein, right? So when we take a short axis view, right, a cut section, you will see the femoral artery, you will see the femoral vein and you will see the great sapiness vein opening into it when you take a short axis view and giving that uh, Mickey Mouse appearance. So this is how we have the Mickey Mouse appearance, the femoral artery, femoral vein, great sapiness vein. And when we press, the venous side will get compressed. The veins will get compressed. The normal veins will get compressed. The artery will remain intact. So please remember what is happening again. The Mickey Mouse appearance on ultrasound thigh is a feature of what? Saphenofemoral junction. And when you press with the probe, the venous side will end. So whenever in ultrasound you want to know which is a vein, 
popliteal, you're look, putting the probe on the back of the knee and you want to know which is popliteal artery, which is popliteal vein, you just press, whichever gets compressed, whichever gets compressed is the vein, you're putting it in my neck and you want to know which is carotid artery, which is jugular vein, press, the one which is getting compressed is the vein. So normal veins, they show compressibility, the normal veins compress, normal veins will compress, they will be winking. But if there is absent compressibility or lack of compressibility, lack of compressibility, this indicates the deep venous thrombosis. That is the reason DVT is diagnosed on a duplex ultrasound where you see absent color fill and lack of compressibility of the vessels. So absence of compressibility is suggestive of deep vein thrombosis. And what are the other places where we see Mickey Mouse appearance? In the liver, because we have the portal triad, the hip, bile duct, hepatic artery and all. So when you're putting the probe here, in the portal triad also, you see a Mickey Mouse appearance. Same thing, the hepatic artery, the portal vein and the bile duct together. In MRI brain, whenever the mid midbrain is atrophic, so normally midbrain is like this. In progressive supranuclear palsy, you get a midbrain atrophy. It becomes very rounded and shrunken. So when it becomes rounded and shrunken, in progressive supranuclear palsy, you get this Mickey Mouse appearance. Mickey Mouse appearance on an antenatal scan. Remember, when we have anencephaly, I don't have the cranial vault. This cranial vault is not there. So you don't have the cranial vault. So you have the orbits on the top and this is the face. So this is called frog eye appearance or Mickey Mouse appearance. So the frog eye appearance or Mickey Mouse appearance, this is anencephaly. On a bone scan, Paget's disease, this has ivory vertebra. Ivory vertebra is a very plastic case. So, where you have the vertebral body as well as the transverse process under a very lot of osteoblastic activity. So, the transverse process and the, the vertebral body, they take up a lot of, you know, osteoblastic activity, giving you a, a Mickey Mouse appearance on bone scan. So, that is also Mickey Mouse appearance on bone scan seen with Paget's disease, which has the ivory vertebra. So, these are important Mickey Mouse appearances. Let us revise them once again. On the thigh, it is saphenofemoral junction. On the ultrasound liver is the portal triad. On the antenatal scan, it is anencephaly. On the MRI brain, when you get MRI brain, the progressive supranuclear palsy, progressive supranuclear palsy shows you this midbrain atrophy showing you Mickey Mouse appearance. On the bone scan is Paget's disease. Let's come to the next part, the obstetric ultrasound. In obstetric ultrasound, the first one we talk about is nuchal translucency scan. All of you are comfortable with the speed? Shall, you, shall I increase the speed or slow down a bit? Are you all comfortable? We have finished two chapters, the introduction part. We have done some important topics of uh, ultrasound. We will go to obstetric and gynec. I will do chapter by chapter so that you know you are all comfortable for your revision part. Is the speed okay? Just give me a quick confirmation. Is the speed okay guys? Quickly if you can mention me in the chat, I will plan accordingly. Or do you want me to slow down or do you want me to increase the speed? Yes, okay. So, next one. So, obstetric ultrasound, the first one we go is nuchal translucency scan. Nuchal translucency and nasal bone scan, NT and B scan. So we do this thing to look at the lucent, look, lucent area behind the neck of the fetus and also we try to look for the nasal bone here. So this is usually done at the time of 11 to 13 weeks, 6 days or 11 to 14 weeks you can learn, 11 weeks to 14 weeks or more accurately 11 weeks to 13 weeks, 6 days. So this is the time when you get a nuchal translucency scan done. So it is valid and it is more reliable only when you do it between 11 weeks to 13 weeks, 6 days. And the cutoff here for nuchal translucency is 3 mm, normally is less than 3 mm. So the nuchal translucency scan, the cutoff is normally is less than 3 mm. If it is more than 3 mm, nuchal translucency more than 3 mm and absent nasal bone is there. These suggest there is aneuploidy, chromosomal abnormality in the baby. Do not confuse this with another scan that we do called as nuchal skin fold thickness scan. This is done in the second trimester, usually between 18 to 24 weeks of gestation. 
where we look at the skin thickness behind the occiput. Here we are looking at the lucent area behind the neck of the fetus. Here we are looking at the skin thickness, right, in, behind, in the occiput. And the cutoff here is generally less than 6 mm. And if it is more than 6 mm, this also suggests aneuploidy, any chromosome abnormality. Usually Downs, but could be any other chromosomal abnormality also. So usually it suggests aneuploidy, any chromosome abnormality. So both nuchal translucency and nuchal skin fold thickness, you should remember. Nuchal translucency scan, what is a cutoff? 3 mm. And what is a cutoff of nuchal skin fold thickness? 6 mm. When is nuchal translucency scan done? Between 11 weeks to 13 weeks, 6 days. So whenever you have an elderly mother, where you have, you know, or, or else their family already has a Downs baby with them, right? You please send for ultrasound between 11 weeks to 13 weeks, 6 days for a nuchal translucency, right? For nuchal translucency scan. So please be careful with this thing. Next. The next important thing is to look for the fetal biometry. Right, so coming to fetal parameters that we have, the first one is crown rump length. Crown rump length. The CRL, there are important points about CRL that I want you to remember. CRL is the most accurate for gestational age in the first trimester. So the most accurate for gestational age is crown rump length. It is also the most accurate for expected date of delivery. Right? So to know the expected date of delivery also, we go for crown rump length that is done in the first trimester. A crown rump length more than 7 mm should have a cardiac activity normally. But if there is no cardiac activity, this is a missed abortion right? or a failed intrauterine pregnancy. Missed abortion or a failed intrauterine pregnancy. So remember these three points about CRL. It is the most accurate for gestational age, especially in the first trimester it is done. It is the most accurate to know the correct expected date of delivery. And also, when the crown rump length is more than 7 mm, you should see cardiac activity. If you don't see the fetal cardiac activity, it indicates missed abortion or a failed intrauterine pregnancy. Next, biparietal diameter, where you look at the outer, parietal, outer part of the outer parietal bone to the inner part of the inner parietal bone, this is also used for gestational age in second and third trimester. Both second and third trimester, the gestational age is by BPD. If the shape of the skull is abnormal, if you are having dolichocephaly, plagiocephaly, I cannot use BPD. Now what I do is I look at the circumference. I look at the circumference. So whenever the shape of the skull is abnormal, then to look at gestational age, we go for head circumference. So these are about these fetal biometry parameters. Once again, crown rump length in the first trimester, BPD in the second and third trimester, head circumference when there are abnormal shapes of the skull. What about femur length? Femur length can also be used for gestational age, especially in late third trimester, close to labor, we can use femur length to look at the gestational age. So it can also be used in late third trimester. If the shape of the femur is like a telephone handle, it is seen associated with a type of skeletal dysplasia called as thanatophoric skeletal dysplasia. Remember T for T. Telephone handle appearance of femur, short and bent femur like a telephone handle receiver. So that is seen with a thanatophoric skeletal dysplasia. And whenever you have short long bones, again that is also a finding that is also with aneuploidy. So short femur, short humerus should also make, that, make you think that there could be chromosomal abnormality in the baby. So these things about femur length. Once again, Femur length can be used to look at gestational age, especially late third trimester. But generally, third trimester, we use BPD only. Femur length can also be used. A telephone handle appearance of the femur. This is suggestive of thanatophoric skeletal dysplasia. Short femurs on ultrasound and antenatal scan. I am seeing the fetal femur is very, very small. Right? I, short long bones should also make you think of aneuploidy. Abdominal circumference. This is about fetal growth. And this is both IUGR as well as macrosomia. We go for abdominal circumference. Trans cerebellar diameter. Now, this cerebellar diameter, the cerebellar diameter posteriorly, the trans cerebellar diameter is the least affected in IUGR. It is the least affected parameter in IUGR. Because it is least affected, you can use it to look at gestational age in IUGR. So, please do not get confused with these two things. IUGR is evaluated by abdominal circumference. IUGR, the fetal biometry parameter that is eval used to evaluate IUGR is abdominal circumference. 
But if you want to use gestational age, if you want to look at gestational age in IUGR, then you go for transcerebellar diameter because it is the least affected in IUGR. Among all the parameters that we have, the least affected is your transcerebellar diameter. Are we clear with this? So, these are all important for your, these are all there in your OBG also, these are all important, okay. Please, all of these are questions that you have in your, you know, different exam. You must have, you know, gone through this in OBG also. So, please study them properly, okay. All, only high yield content I have kept here. Next thing, where do you see lambda sign and a T sign? Where do you see a lambda sign, anybody? Where do you see a lambda sign on an antenatal scan? Lambda sign, which is also called as twin peak sign, twin peak, lambda or twin peak sign. This means there is a thick septa, thick intervening septa. So the septa here, this thickness is more between the two twins. So this is seen in diamniotic, dichorionic twin gestation, diamniotic, dichorionic twin gestation. This will show you lambda sign or twin peak sign. T sign, there is a thin septa. T sign basically means there is thin septa. And why is there thin septa? Because there is only one chorion. So T sign is also seen in diamniotic but monochorionic. So both are diamniotic. But in case of your lambda, there is two chorions. In case of your T, there is monochorionic. So diamniotic monochorionic is T sign. Diamniotic and dichorionic is lambda sign. So twin peak sign or lambda sign is diamniotic dichorionic. And your diamniotic and monochorionic is T sign. Right? Next one. So sarcoidosis, what you are talking about, about lambda sign, that is not an antenatal scan, that is on a gallium 67 scan, okay. So I will teach you that when I do the respiratory part, but for now you remember this thing. Anyways, coming to the next thing, if you have a mother who is complaining that she is not able to feel fetal movements, right, a pregnant lady comes to you and says she is not able to feel her fetal movements for many days and you get an ultrasound and you get this image there where you are seeing this overlapping of sutural bones. You can see the sutural bones are overlapping. This is called as Spalding sign. And what does this indicate? This is suggestive of IUGR, intrauterine death, IUD, intrauterine death. So, overlapping of sutural bone is a bad sign on ultrasound. It indicates intrauterine death. Air, I told you, is white on ultrasound. So, if you see white air in the inferior vena cava, in the iota, in the chambers of the heart, this is called as Robert sign. Robert sign is air in great vessels. This is also suggestive of intrauterine death, a very bad sign. So, two antenatal findings that I want you to remember for intrauterine death. One is Spalding sign, remember S for S, sutural bones, overlapping of sutural bones. Robert sign, R you remember as air. Air in great vessels and heart is called as Robert sign. Both of them tell you there is intrauterine death, IUD, right? So, please remember this. Next. Coming to a very favorite of the examiners, anencephaly. Anencephaly, you all know, is due to failure of closure of anterior neuropore. Spina bifida will occur when there is failure of closure of posterior neuropore. And what are the findings that you see? You will see there is absent cranial wall. The cranial bone is not there. You can see here there is absent cranial wall, there is a crania and the orbits will appear on the top giving a froggy appearance or Mickey Mouse appearance. So you have a a crania that is absent cranial wall, you have a froggy or Mickey Mouse appearance that we just studied okay on the antenatal ultrasound and you will see that if you can see a sagittal image here also these are the bones the mandible, the maxilla, the facial bones, but you are not seeing the similar bone on the uh, cranium, right? So, they gave this sagittal image and you had to pick it up as anencephaly. The question was, the following ultrasound image is obtained from a female uh, pregnant uh, with uh, amenorrhea for the past few months who comes to you for second opinion because her previous doctor has advised abortion. What is the likely diagnosis? The following ultrasound image is obtained from a female who is having amenorrhea and uh, she came to you for second opinion because her previous doctor advised abortion. What is your likely diagnosis? So when you see the image on this where you are not seeing the cranial vault, you don't see the cranial bone, you are having loosely arranged brain parenchyma or you have a frog eye appearance or you know Mickey Mouse appearance, all of this is suggestive of anencephaly. It is the earliest congenital anomaly to be diagnosed. Out of all of them, it is the earliest to be diagnosed. 
Can you tell me what is the earliest time we can diagnose this? What is the earliest time we can diagnose this? This can be diagnosed by around 10 to 11 weeks of gestation. And what is the best time? When you can diagnose it better? After 14 weeks, right? So best time is more confidently we can diagnose after 14 weeks. Can you tell me what is the enzymes that are elevated in uh, open neural tube defects? What will be increased? There will be increase in acetyl cholinesterase levels, right? So there will be increase in acetyl cholinesterase levels in case of open neural tube defects. Are we okay? That is about some obstetric ultrasound. Then a few things on the ultrasound, especially in the gynec imaging. We have two important no, imaging. One is PCOS and OHSS and how do we differentiate this? They may be giving you antenatal ultrasound image and you have to identify which is PCOS and which is OHSS based on the image itself. They can give you relevant history. They can give you female with acne, infertility, right? Irregular menses. All of these they can give you. Here they will give you female with infertility on treatment right? or receiving injections of HC. They can give you this history if they are kind enough. But just by looking at the image also, you should not, you know, confuse between which is PCOS and which is OHSS, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. OHSS is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So the first thing that I want you to look at is the stroma. Look how the stroma is. PCOS is not a problem of the cyst, right? It is not about cyst. PCOS is a misnomer. It is not about multiple cysts. It is about a thick stroma. In PCOS, you have a thick echogenic stroma. There is a thick echogenic stroma. There is thick stroma which makes the ovarian volume to be increased. Ovarian volume becomes more than 10 ml. And it is a stroma that produces androgens, right? So there is more stroma, more androgens in PCOS. The follicles are very small, small peripheral follicles will be there. The follicles are small peripheral follicles and giving that string of pearl appearance. Right? So it is not about follicles, it is about the stroma in PCOS. In OHSS, you have central spoke wheel like stroma, tire wheel like or spoke wheel like stroma. Large follicles, large cysts and this is always bilateral. So, you are giving injection, exogenous HCG, so bilaterally the ovaries will be stimulated. Another important thing about OHSS is because these stimulated ovaries, ovarian hyperstimulation, right, these stimulated ovaries release vasoactive peptides which cause capillary leaks and third space collections. So, you have pleural effusions and ascites because the stimulated ovaries are releasing peptides which are causing capillary leaks you have third space collection. So, whenever you are given a question which is having pericardial collections, ascites, pull effusions with bilaterally enlarged ovaries, right, in a patient receiving HCG injections, think of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Even with the image, look at central spoke wheel like stroma, bilaterally enlarged ovaries, large cysts, OHSS is the preferred answer. Small peripheral cysts, thick echogenic stroma, PCOS is the answer just by looking at the ultrasound image. Element history and all also should help you, okay. Let's come to the next one. Let's come to the next one. How to differentiate a true gestational sac from a pseudo gestational sac? So in early pregnancies, okay, so when you have a female coming very soon after missing the periods, right? So you should know whether you are looking at a true gestational sac or not. So the thing to remember is the true gestational sac, imagine this is the cervix and this is the uterus, right? The true gestational sac is more embedded within the decidua. It is intradecidual, whereas a pseudo gestational sac is central. The pseudo gestational sac is more central. The true gestational sac it is lined by two layers of decidua. They are having two layers. It is double decidual sac. There is only one layer here. There are two layers of decidua. So you have a intradecidual sac sign. So a decidua which is eccentric is called as intradecidual, that is eccentric location. This is more central. Here you have a double decidual sac, right? So made up of decidua. What are the two decidua that it is made up of? Decidua capsularis and decidua parietalis. You can remember with a police post, right? We have ACP, DCP. 
remember DCP, decidua capsularis and parietalis. Basalis forms the placenta. The capsularis is surrounding the gestational sac and the parietalis is even the one which is lining the inner wall of the endometrium. So you have capsularis and the parietalis. And you have two small blebs developing inside. One thick one, the yolk sac, and one thin one, the amnion. And between them, there will be embryo that is growing. So this is called as double blep sign. And this double blep is made up of amnion and yolk sac. Amnion and yolk sac. So that is how we differentiate a true gestational sac from a pseudo gestational sac. A true gestational sac is intradecidual, eccentric. A true gestational sac will have two layers of the decidua, the decidua capsularis and parietalis. A true gestational sac will have double blep, the amnion and the yolk sac. A pseudo gestational sac will be center in location, lined only by one layer of decidua, right? So this is your pseudo gestational sac. Is this clear all of you? Can we move forward? Few more gynec questions will do. Let us look at this question. Try to answer this question, guys. A 60 year old female, so a postmenopausal female with bleeding, intermittent bleeding per vagina, there is endometrial collection with thickening and anterior bulging of the fundal area. On ultrasound, there is a feeding vessel. What is the likely diagnosis? Even of you, what do you think is the likely diagnosis? A postmenopausal female. Bleeding per vagina. What do you think this could be? Very good, Yashwardhan. This is a classic finding of endometrial polyp. So, whenever you see the feeding artery or pedicle artery, the feeding artery or pedicle artery, think of endometrial polyp. So, the postmenopausal bleeding can be either endometrial carcinoma or a polyp also. And a focal thickening, right, only anterior bulge is mentioned. A focal thickening is more in favor of polyp. A diffuse thickening is seen with endometrial carcinoma. A focal thickening is an endometrial polyp. And to differentiate that, we can sometimes go for sonoestro salpinography. We put a saline infusion and then do ultrasound. So saline infusion sonography or sonoestro salpinography can tell you whether it is a diffuse thickening or a focal thickening. And usually, whenever you have a polyp, Right? So, when we have a polyp like this, you see a vessel entering into it that is called as the feeding artery or a pedicle artery, suggestive of endometrial polyp. So, please remember this important finding. This is a very classic term. A feeding vessel sign or a pedicle artery sign is suggestive of an endometrial polyp. Right? Next one. Now, if you have a gestational sac which is more than 25 mm and no yolk sac, Right? This is again a failed intrauterine pregnancy, a blighted ovum or a failed intrauterine pregnancy. And some and if there is CRL and no cardiac activity, this is also a failed intrauterine pregnancy or a missed abortion. So both of them indicate a failed intrauterine pregnancy. So two criteria you want you to remember when you're doing a ultrasound in a young early gestation, if the mean sac diameter is more than 25 mm with no yolk sac, or if you see the embryo, if you see the CRL, which is more than 7 mm, but no cardiac activity, both of them tell you there is missed abortion or a failed intrauterine pregnancy. Clear with this? Okay. So whenever you have a ovarian lesion, which is completely anechoic with a posterior acoustic enhancement like this, this is a ovarian, simple ovarian follicle, okay, simple follicular cyst. It is completely anechoic, right, with postacoustic enhancement. But if you see this fishnet appearance or reticular appearance, this is suggestive of fibrin strands that have developed. The fishnet or reticular or network like appearance or lacy appearance, you call it lacy appearance on ultrasound. This is suggestive of a hemorrhagic ovarian cyst. Hemorrhagic ovarian cyst. Because of the hemorrhage, there will be fibrin strands that will be developed, giving that fishnet appearance. And if you have repeated bleeding within the follicle, right, so there is an ovarian cyst with repeated bleeding over a period of time. So that will produce a lot of debris inside, giving a ground glass appearance. So ground glass appearance on ultrasound in the ovarian lesion, think of an endometrioma or a chocolate cyst. Because of the repeated cyclical bleeding that you have, there will be a which gives that ground glass appearance. So, 
fishnet appearance, reticular lacy appearance is hemorrhagic ovarian cyst. Remember, hemorrhagic ovarian cyst resolves on its own, resolves on its own, right? In the next uh, scan, you will not find it. Uh, endometrioma or a chocolate cyst is cyclical bleeding within the lesion, giving this ground glass appearance because of internal debris. So, these are about ovarian lesions that you have. Look at this. A T1 hyperintense lesion in the ovary. A T1 hyperintense cyst in the ovary. Now, T1 hyperintense. A fluid would have been black on T1, white on T2. We all know World War II, water is white on T2. But if it is white on T1, if it is hyperintense on T1, it is not fluid, it is fat containing. It is fat containing. A fat containing cyst in the ovary is a dermoid cyst, right? Or a mature, we also call it as a mature cystic teratoma. Mature cystic teratoma, right? So, this is T1 hyperintense cyst. Remember, fat is white both on T1 and T2. Fat is always white both on T1 and T2. So, T1 hyperintense cyst means there is a fat containing cyst suggestive of a dermoid cyst or a mature cystic teratoma. So, we have finished osteotic ultrasound, the gynec ultrasound, some important topics. Let us move to the uroradiology part. Right? So, comfortable so far, guys? We have done four chapters. We have done introduction, we have done ultrasound, we have done obstetric and the gynec ultrasound. Can we go to the next one? All of you okay? Quickly let me know if you are all comfortable and uh, following. I will move to the next chapter. Yes, waiting for your answers, waiting for your, you know, response. Shall we move ahead? Euroradiology. Yashwardhan, Cortex, Mohan, Titraj, Roy, Jacob, all of you, right? Following? Chalo. Let us come to the next one then. Be more interactive, okay? So, it will help me stay with you guys, okay? Med. Okay. Chalo. Let us see whether you can answer this question. Let us come to the next one. So, we will start with Euroradiology. Let us come to this one. A delayed intravenous urogram of the patient is shown, right? And what is the most likely diagnosis? So, there is an IVP image given to you, a delayed uh, uro, intravenous urogram image. And what is the likely diagnosis? So, is it a staghorn calculus, putti kidney, pelvic junction obstruction, renal cyst? Can you tell me what is this? A uh, delayed phase of intravenous urogram or IVP image is shown. And... Uh, what is the likely diagnosis? What do you think is this? Very good, right? So, you can see on the right side, the right pelvic calcial system, the right ureter, right? And the contrast is entering the bladder. But I cannot see the left ureter. I see the contrast filling up in the pelvis only, in the left side. So, this is a left PUJ obstruction. There is a left PUJ obstruction. So, whenever we have a PUJ obstruction, Whenever we have a PUJ obstruction, the contrast stays back in that. So, there will be an uh, image filled with contrast even on the delayed imaging. So, you will not be able to visualize the ureter, but there will be pooling of the contrast in the pelvis of that kidney. So, there is this PUJ obstruction. So, you can see here there is contrast coming into the ureter on the right side, but there is no contrast coming to the left ureter. It is pulled up in that side. So, this is PUJ obstruction. So, remember this, okay. So, PUJ obstruction. Next. Let's look at this next question. Let me see if you can answer this. A six-year-old child presents with recurrent UTI. So, it's a young child with recurrent UTI. What is the likely diagnosis? And they gave you an IVP image, okay? And uh, they are showing you a um, bladder. So, it's in the bladder. And uh, what is the likely diagnosis? So, once it comes into the bladder, the patient is, you know, trying to void. So, during the MCU phase, micturition cystoyothrography, Instead of coming into the urethra only, it is going back into the ureters, causing gross distension of the ureters. So, this is a condition where you are seeing vesico-ureteric reflux. So, once the contrast has come into the bladder, it should go in. Once it comes, it should empty through the you know, ureter. Now, it should come into the bladder. From the bladder, it should only go into the urethra. But it is going back 
from the bladder into the ureters, right? So this is vesicoureteric reflux. Remember the investigation of choice for vesicoureteric reflux is micturation or a widening cystourethrography. Widening cystourethrography, right? So this is a gross dilatation that you have of the ureters. Okay, try to answer this one, guys. Which radioisotope is used for measuring GFR? Which radioisotope is used to look at GFR? Fast. TMSA, DTPA, MAC3, okay, or repuric acid, which one? Please remember, TMSA is for anatomy, right? So, morphology or anatomy. It is used for cortical scars. It is for cortical function, right? Corticomedullary differences for cortical function, cortical scars. To look at scars after VUR and all, we go for DMSA. DTPA is only filtered. It is neither reabsorbed, neither secreted in the tubules of the kidney. So, it is only filtered. So, it is the one which represents GFR. So, it is a DTPA that represents GFR. M MAC3, this is for renal plasma flow, renal perfusion, renal perfusion, renal plasma flow. Or because it is not just filtered, it is also secreted in the tubules. It tells you about glomerular function and also tubular function. So it is not just talking about glomerular function, it is also talking about tubular function. So basically MAC3 would be the one preferred for renal function. So be careful whether they said glomerular function, whether they said cortical function or glomerular function or renal function. Don't get confused, right? So for anatomy, for scars, for cortical function, DMSA, right? So remember S for S, scars is by DMSA. Only one use of DTPA, please remember DTPA is for GFR, GFR is DTPA. Anything to do with flow, right? So the renal plasma flow, renal perfusion, as well as to know the renal function, to know the glomerular as well as tubular function, we go for MAC3. It's basically about the, you know, how the nephron excretes this, okay? You should not get confused, listen to this, right? Which one is what? Listen to what I'm saying. DMSA, it gets filtered and reabsorbed in the cortex, right? So this is the cortex of the kidney, this is the medulla of the kidney. So DMSA will tell you about cortical function, corticomedullary differentiation, it will tell you any scars in the cortex, right? So U-shaped scars in the cortex, this is by DMSA. DTP on the other hand, it gets filtered, it is neither reabsorbed, it is neither secreted, only comes back same as what is filtered. So DPPA will tell you about GFR. MAC3 on the other hand, MAC3, MAC3 will not just be filtered, it will also be secreted. So, because it is filtered and secreted, not from the peritubular capillaries and the vasa recta. So, MAC3 will talk about glomerular function as well as the, uh, you know, tubular function. So, it is also getting secreted and talks about plasma flow, right, renal perfusion also because it is coming from the peritubular capillaries also. So, basically, MAC3 is for renal plasma flow, renal perfusion, renal function, whereas DTPA is only for GFR. Are we clear with this? So, the answer here is... DTPA, DTPA. Are we clear with all of this? I hope this is comfortable. Let's come to the next one. Let's come to the next one. Patient with abdominal pain and sterile pyuria, a radiograph is given. What is the diagnosis? Is it putty kidney, nephrocalcinosis, calcified psoas abscess, or a staghorn calculi? What do you think is the answer here? Very good. So, whenever you are given a word sterile pyuria and you see a atrophic calcified kidney here, this is a putty kidney, suggest you of renal tuberculosis. So, whenever the word sterile pyuria in Indian context is given, think of renal tuberculosis, okay. So, let us quickly revise renal TB, right. So remember, the investigation of choice is a CT urography, which is a type of CECT. If that is not given, please go it as CECT. Basically, a, a, you know, uh, advancement where you have a better imaging of the pelvic calcium system and the ureter, right? So, CT urography is same as CECT, okay? Reconstruction of CECT is called as CT urography. Renal TB, you will see findings in the kidney, findings in the ureter, findings in the bladder. 
In the kidney, you see the earliest findings are the moth-eaten calluses. You see ground glass calcifications called as putti kidney, which then become more denser called as cement kidney. So you will be given this, you know, patient with loin pain, sterile pyuria and a calcified kidney like this. Okay, so please remember, right, this is renal tuberculosis. Coming to the findings in the ureter, you will see a corkscrew or a beaded appearance of the ureter. There will be kinking of the ureters. There will be a gold fold ureteric orifice, okay, so which is a cystoscopic finding. When you do a endoscopy, you see that the orifice is all smooth called as gold fold ureteric orifice. Sometimes the calyx can be fibrosed and not visible called as phantom calyx, phantom calyx. So beaded appearance or coxco appearance, kinking of the ureter, gold fold ureteric orifice and a phantom calyx. In the bladder, you have a thimble bladder. Remember, thimble bladder is non-calcific. Bladder wall calcifications, they happen in cystosomiasis. Bladder wall calcification is feature of cystosomiasis. Whereas thimble bladder is non-calcific. Whereas bladder wall calcifications, okay, a skull-like calcification of the bladder wall is feature of cystosomiasis, non tuberculosis. In TB or thimble bladder is a non-calcific bladder. The kidney gets calcified but not the bladder, right? So the kidney is getting calcified. You're having putti kidney and cement kidney. The thimble bladder is an atrophic, low volume, non-calcific bladder. Okay. Now, look at these guys. What do you think is this contrast CT image showing you? What is this contrast CT image showing you? Can you tell me what is this image showing you? This has been in the exam. This is, you can see here, this is the right kidney here this is the left kidney here and you can see both of them fusing across the midline so this is your horseshoe kidney so horseshoe kidney both the kidneys lie on either side of the vertebra and fuse across the midline and in horseshoe kidney you will see that because the horseshoe the inferior poles are fusing the inferior calyx will also be medially oriented because the inferior poles are fusing the inferior calyces will also be medially oriented this is called as your shaking hand sign on IVP and the shape of, of the pelvic calcium system and the ureter takes the shape of a flower vase. So in horseshoe kidney on IVP, you see this shaking hand sign and a flower vase sign, basically a medially oriented inferior calyx. So if you are given an IVP image, CT scan image, I know all of you will identify. Right? Last exam in the FMG, they gave this uh, CT scan image of horseshoe kidney. But if they give you IVP image, please listen to what I am saying. Look at the inferior calyx. Is it medially oriented? A medially oriented inferior calyx is what is called as shaking hand sign, feature of horseshoe kidney. Next, this image, I hope all of you know, the classic cobra head appearance or adder head appearance. This is suggest you of a urethroceal, cobra head appearance or adder head appearance. Now, let us look at this image. This is an angiography image showing a Coxscrew appearance of renal artery and this is a young female with hypertension. What do you think this is? Coxscrew appearance of renal artery in a young female with hypertension. This is fibromuscular dysplasia. Fibromuscular dysplasia. Fibromuscular dysplasia, the most common artery involved is renal artery. The most common artery involved is renal artery. The second most common artery is your internal carotid artery. Because renal artery is involved, you develop hypertension in a young patient, young female with hypertension, right, showing corkscrew appearance of renal artery. Or you may have a corkscrew appearance of internal carotid artery also. That time, the patients will develop transient ischemic attacks. So either there could be corkscrew appearance of renal artery or a corkscrew appearance of renal carotid artery. Both of them is basically fibromuscular dysplasia. Either you have a young patient with hypertension, young female with hypertension, or a young female with transient ischemic attacks. Think of fibromuscular dysplasia. Next. If you have bilaterally enlarged kidneys with multiple cysts and hepatic cysts, right? This is adult polycystic kidney disease having multiple irregularly arranged cysts giving an appearance of a Swiss cheese nephrogram. And when you wait for some time, when the contrast comes into the pelvic calcial system, the contrast will come into this plate pelvic calcial areas, giving that spider leg appearance, so gives that spider leg appearance. So either we get a spider leg appearance on pilogram 
or a species appearance on a nephrogram. Both of them is feature of ADPKD, adult polycystic kidney disease. Childhood polycystic kidney disease that is ARPKD, this is also bilateral. Childhood polycystic kidney disease is also bilateral in large kidneys. This also will have hepatic cyst, right? Hepatic cyst can be seen in childhood also, same as adult. But in childhood, you also additionally have hepatic fibrosis. Fibrocystine is involved, congenital hepatic fibrosis. So it's fibrosis, not the cyst that is differentiating. So childhood will have hepatic fibrosis. And the arrangement of cyst is different. They are not irregular like in adult. In adult, you have irregular cyst, giving that Swiss cheese nephrogram, right? Here, the cysts have an order. They have the long axis perpendicular to the renal cortex or the renal capsule. So, because they have an order, you get alternating bands called as striated nephrogram. So, striated nephrogram is a feature of childhood polycystic kidney disease. So, you get this alternating bands of contrast called as striated nephrogram. A Swiss cheese nephrogram is adult polycystic kidney disease. A striated nephrogram is childhood polycystic kidney disease. A striated nephrogram can also be seen when you have wedge-shaped areas of inflammation in pyelonephritis. Even pyelonephritis, when you have wedge-shaped areas of inflammation, you can get this striated nephrogram. So please remember two causes for striated nephrogram: childhood polycystic kidney disease or a striate or a patient with pyelonephritis. Next, renal cysts is a very common, you know, occurrence in our patients, and. Uh, this on CT scan are classified by Bosnia classification. Using CCT, we classify them. And whenever they write, when the, you see a radiology report showing a renal cyst with a Bosnia grade 1 or 2, it generally means a benign lesion. It's just managed conservatively. But 3 and 4, that means there is more thickness of the wall, more septa, more enhancement. And it could be a cystic RCC also, a malignancy also. So you would go for a surgical management for that. So, renal cysts, they are classified by Bosnia classification. This is based on CECT. 1 and 2 will be managed conservatively. 3 and 4 will be managed by surgery. So, this is how you have a renal cyst on ultrasound. You can see a well-defined anechoic lesion, right, which is separate from the pelvic calcel system. If you see the black area in continuation with the pelvic calcel system, this is hydronephrosis. How to differentiate renal cyst from hydronephrosis? Renal cyst is very different, very distinct, very well defined and separate from the pelvic calcel system. Hydronephrosis obviously will be in continuation with the pelvic calcel system. So you can see here, this is how you have gross hydronephrosis and there is thinning of the parenchyma, peripheral parenchyma is thin, giving you what is called as a rim sign or a crescent sign. So this CT scan is also important. I want you to understand how the hydronephrosis would appear on a CT scan, right? So this is how the kidney appears in you know, a hydronephrotic kidney will appear. So when you have gross hydronephrosis, there is dilatation of the pelvic calcel system and thinning of the parenchyma. So when there is thinning of the parenchyma with gross distension of the pelvic calcel system, there is atrophy and thin parenchyma giving a crescent or a rim-like appearance. That is called as a crescent sign or a rim sign in a chronic gross hydronephrosis. So I hope you are clear how to identify renal cyst, hydronephrosis and a gross hydronephrosis on a CT scan. Look at this question. There is an RTA patient and you are given a coronal and an axial CT scan and this is bones are white so this is CT and you can see the enhancement in the iota, the renal artery, the kidney, right? So this is contrast CT. There is a CCT given to you, right? Coronal and axial in a trauma patient and uh, you are seeing there is non-enhancement of the left kidney. What do you think is this? There is non-enhancement of the one kidney, right? This is a high grade renal injury, a grade 5 renal injury. This is renal vascular pedicle injury. It is a renal vascular pedicle injury, right? So, whenever the renal hilum is avulsed, so this is the kidney, this is avulsed like this. So, whenever this is avulsed like that, so the contrast would not be able to enter and not be able to reach the kidney. So, whenever your renal vascular pedicle injury or renal hilar injury, a great renal injury after trauma, you will see non-enhancement of that side of the renal vessels as well as the kidney. So, you will see that the left renal artery, the left uh, kidney are not enhancing, the right renal artery, the right kidney is enhancing, indicating a renal vascular hilum injury.
Now, look at this radiograph. On a frontal radiograph, you are seeing a calcific density in the right upper quadrant. But when you see a lateral radiograph, it is seen overlapping with the vertebral shadow. So, on a frontal radiograph, it is on the right upper quadrant, but on the lateral radiograph, it is overlapping the vertebral shadow. This indicates this is a renal calculi. A right renal calculi would be like this. But if the calcific density is in the right upper quadrant, but it is anterior to the vertebral shadow, if it is anterior to vertebral shadow, this indicates this is a gallstone. To understand this, just look at this lateral view. We all know kidneys are retroperitoneal. So obviously, if I have a renal calculi, it will overlap the vertebral shadow. But if I have a gallstone, it would be anterior to the vertebral shadow. So on a lateral radiograph, if you have a calcific density overlapping the vertebral bodies, it is a renal calculi. If it is anterior to the vertebral bodies, it is a gallstone. Very simple, right, to understand. Next. And Please remember, on the day of exam, when you see a kidney like this, don't blindly mark it as horseshoe kidney and come. Look, this is only a single kidney and you are seeing the sacroiliac joints, it is in the pelvis. So this is a pelvic kidney, the most common site of ectopic kidney is the pelvic kidney. A horseshoe kidney would be like this, you are seeing the right kidney, you are seeing the left kidney fused across the midline, this is how horseshoe kidney would be. But if you are seeing the sacroiliac joints, you are seeing the pelvis, that is a pelvic kidney, a ectopic kidney. The most common site of ectopic kidney is pelvic kidney. If you see both the kidneys on one side of the vertebra, you can see here both the kidneys are on one side of the vertebra. A horseshoe kidney, both the kidneys are on either side of the vertebra. In horseshoe kidney, both the kidneys are on either side of the vertebra. But if both the kidneys are only one side of the vertebra, this is not a horseshoe kidney, it's a crossed fused ectopic. Please be careful with this image. Don't mark horseshoe kidney and come. Be careful. Horseshoe kidney, both the kidneys are on either side of the vertebra. In crossed fused ectopic, the kidney has crossed the vertebra, crossed the midline and fused with the other kidney. So a crossed fused ectopic, both the kidney will be on one side of the vertebra. A type of crossed fused, where both superior and inferior poles fuse, this is what is a pancake or a donut kidney. So in horseshoe kidney, only the inferior poles will fuse, right? In horseshoe kidney, only the inferior poles are fusing. But if your superior as well as the inferior poles are fusing, that will make it a pancake or a donut kidney, okay? So be careful with this, what is a crossed fused, what is horseshoe, what is pelvic kidney, right? So be careful with these types of kidneys that are coming. Let us look at some important renal masses. You will be given this CT scan images along with the clinical scenario. They'll tell you that there is an elderly smoker with hematuria. And you are given a CT scan showing a lesion in the kidney, showing heterogeneous enhancement. This would be renal cell carcinoma, right? Uh, elderly smoker with RCC showing heterogeneous enhancement. Can you tell me in which condition do you see bilateral RCC? Anybody? Any condition you know which shows bilateral RCC? In both the kidneys are having renal cell carcinomas, bilateral RCCs. Anybody? Anybody can just text in if you could remember anybody. I hope you remember, right? Hemangioblastomas, bilateral RCCs, pancreatic cysts. These are all features of von Hippel-Lindau syndrome. Retinal hemangioblastomas, cerebellar hemangioblastomas, bilateral RCC. These are features of von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, right? Von Hippel-Lindau syndrome. And what is a lesion? Very good, Mohan. Very good, Ashwardhan. Can you tell me a lesion which is seen in the kidney showing a central stellate scar like this? What is a lesion in the kidney showing a star-shaped scar, central stellate scar in the kidney? A central stellate scar in the kidney is suggestive of oncocytoma, right? Can be seen in tuberous sclerosis patients also, but the classic finding is a central stellate scar. And if you see a lesion in the kidney, which is having a density similar to the subcutaneous fat, it is having fat density, it is appearing similar to the density of the subcutaneous fat. So, uh, if you have a fat containing lesion in the kidney, this is angiomyolipoma, angiomyolipoma, right? So, both these also are seen in tuberous sclerosis, especially bilateral angiomyolipomas, these are features of tuberous sclerosis. So, please remember bilateral angiomyolipomas, lipoma means fat containing, bilateral angiomyolipomas are features of tuberous sclerosis, bilateral RCC is feature of von hippel lindau syndrome, von hippel lindau syndrome. Next, then 
some pediatric masses that will be asked for you. They will be giving you that is a child with the, you know, abdominal mass and you need to differentiate which is neuroblastoma, which is Wilms tumor. Remember, neuroblastoma, I will write it like this. Neuro, it's helping, it will help you in your pediatrics also. Just concentrate on what I am telling tell you. Wilms tumor. Right? Neuroblastoma, this is like less than 2 years. Generally less than 2 years and looks like 2 to me. W looks like 3 to me. So generally this is between 3 to 4 years of age group. Right? So neuroblastoma generally will be a child less than 2 years. Limbs tumor will be generally a child around 3 to 4 years. E. Neuroblastoma encases the vessels, elevates the iota. So if you are given this word that there is a mass in the abdomen in a child, a one year old child which is encasing the vessels, right? Think of neuroblastoma. Wilms tumor, I for invades the vessels, invades the renal vein, invades the iota, okay? So invades vessels. Invasion into the vessels is seen by Wilms tumor. Encasement and elevation is seen with neuroblastoma. B. Neuroblastoma shows bone metastasis. Bone metastasis. Wilms tumor will have lung metastasis. Generally, lung metastases are seen with Wilms tumor. Calcification plus two, two calcification are seen with you know neuroblastoma. Calcifications are more common with neuroblastoma. Wilms tumor calcifications are rare. So at least these you remember and you should be able to pick up. Okay, with the, which is neuroblastoma and which is Wilms tumor in the pediatric age group. So neuroblastoma and look at the name neuroblastoma, big name. Wilms tumor is small name. So which crosses midline? which crosses midline, the neuroblastoma crosses midline, crosses the vertebra, goes to the other side. This usually does not cross midline. This does not cross midline. Right? So, Wilms is small name. Neuroblastoma is big name. Are we clear with this? So, just are the radiological things that will be mentioned in the question. So, be careful. On a CT scan, the lesion is found to be crossing the midline, encasing the vessels, right? Calcifications are seen. Go in favor of neuroblastoma. And if this is mentioned that the CT scan shows the lesion, uh, you know, limited to the kidney, does not cross the midline, no, no calcifications, invading into the vessels, think of Wilms tumor. Age group also, please remember. Next. Look at this question. Identify the condition based on the given IVP image. Look at the IVP image and try to identify the condition. What do you think is this? Is it pelvic kidney, horseshoe kidney, duplex kidney or cross ectopic kidney? What is this image showing you? Anybody? Mm. Any more answers? One is saying duplex, one is saying ectopic. Mm. Remember, how many kidneys do we have in duplex kidney? How many kidneys do we have in duplex kidney? In duplex kidney, we generally have three kidneys. Right? So, we have a normal kidney and one side will be duplicated. In crossed ectopic, you have two kidneys. One kidney must have crossed the midline, crossed the vertebra and fused with the other. So, you are not seeing the normal kidney, the normal renal fossa here. So, you are only seeing two kidneys on one side. The correct answer for this is a crossed ectopic kidney, crossed ectopic kidney. So, please remember duplex kidney. Let me show you an example. Look here. Look here. So, here how many kidneys do you see? 1, 2, 3. So, this is what is a duplication. Right? So, duplication is different and a cross fused ectopic is different. If you see the normal kidney in the normal renal fossa and duplication on one side, that is a duplication system or a duplex kidney. But if you don't see the normal kidney in the normal renal fossa, that is a cross fused ectopic. Okay? Be careful on the IVP image. Next. So, whenever we have a duplication system, right, the, there is a rule called as weigert mayer rule. So, whenever we have a duplication system, so there is a rule called as weigert mayer rule. So, weigert mayer rule is seen with duplication or duplex kidney. And what does this rule say is whenever you have two duplication like this, so we have a superior ureter, we have an inferior ureter, right. So, there is a superior ureter, there is an inferior ureter. If I trace the superior ureter, it will always go more inferiorly and medially. 
right? And will be prone to obstruction in the form of urethrocytes. Whereas the lower ureter will open normally, superiorly and laterally. So what does our Weigert mayer rule say? Weigert mayer rule says that the superior ureter inserts inferomedially. It goes more inferiorly, inferomedially. That is ectopically. It inserts ectopically on the bladder and is prone to obstruction. Prone to obstruction mainly in the form of urethrosy. That is, you can remember it as SEMO. Remember SEMO. The superior ureter inserts inferomedially, IM, and is prone to obstruction. Remember SEMO. Right? Superior ureter inserts inferomedially and is prone to obstruction in the form of, you know, urethrocytes. Opposite is also correct. The inferior ureter, the inferior ureter inserts normally, orthotopically, not ectopically, orthotopically, superolaterally, opposite of inferomedially, superolateral. And is prone to reflux, not obstruction, prone to reflux. So, VUR or vesicuratory reflux will happen in inferior ureter, urethroceal or obstruction will happen in superior ureter. So, to remember Vigat Mayer rule, just remember SEMO and the rest of it will follow. Superior ureter inserts inferomedially, that is ectopically, and is prone to obstruction. So, the opposite of that is with lower ureter. So, you know, you can manage. Orthotopic insertion is normal insertion. Ectopic insertion is seen with superior ureter. Normal insertion is seen with lower ureter. So, remember SEMO, you, opposite of that is with inferior ureter, superior laterally and prone to reflux. Okay, you should be able to identify Weigert Mayer rule, right, with duplication system. Next. Look at this question now. Look at this question. Identify the condition based on the given IVP image. So, you are given an IVP image. So, you are seeing there is this pelvic calcium system which is drooping downwards. There it is above the pelvis but drooping downwards. So, there is a drooping lily sign. So, this is called as a drooping lily sign. So, where do you see this drooping lily sign? Where do you see a drooping lily sign? So, drooping lily sign D for D. Remember, it is feature of duplex kidney. Drooping lily sign is feature of duplex kidney. So, whenever we have a duplex kidney, so where, do, where is a duplex kidney? Drooping lily sign. This is seen when we have a duplication system, but the upper moiety is non-functional with non-functional upper moiety. So, it will not take up contrast. So, it will not show any contrast. So, you will see that the upper moiety is not taking up contrast. It is just pushing the lower moiety downward. So, because it is non-functional, it will not take up contrast. It will only push the lower moiety downward, giving this drooping lily sign. It is also seen in any upper pole mass, like an RCC or a renal abscess, right? Uh, any upper pole mass, right? Upper pole mass can produce, right? Any kind of upper pole mass like an abscess, like an RCC can push the, you know, lower moiety downward giving that uh, appearance of a drooping lily sign. So, drooping lily sign can be seen with duplication or any upper pole masses. Next, a maiden waist deformity. So, when the two ureters are, you know, coming very close to the vertebra, right, if I mean a narrow waist like this, like a waist of a beautiful lady. This is called as a maiden waist deformity. It occurs when there is retroperitoneal fibrosis. Remember, kidney and ureter are retroperitoneal structures. So, when there is retroperitoneal fibrosis, obviously, it will push the ureter closer to the vertebra. So, retroperitoneal fibrosis will produce you maiden waist deformity. And where do you see this fish hooking of the right mid ureter? So, this fish hook appearance of right mid ureter. This occurs when the vena cava develops anterior to the ureter. So, it is a problem in the development of the vena cava. When the vena cava develops anterior to the ureter, when we have a pre-ureteral vena cava. So, it will occur only on the right side because IVC is on the right side. So, when we have a pre-ureteral vena cava, you have fish hooking of right mid-ureter, right? This is also called as retro caval ureter. Previously called as retrocaval. We thought it is a ureter going behind the vena cava. So, we called it retrocaval. But the correct term is preureteral vena cava. It is a developmental defect of vena cava. So, the correct term is preureteral vena cava. The options may not show retrocaval ureter. 
right the correct term is preureteral vena cava remember the correct term preureteral vena cava shows fish hooking or reverse j appearance of right mid ureter a fish hooking of distal ureter is feature of bph obviously when we have prostate hyperplasia when the prostate hyperplasia happens the distal ureters will go into fish hooking so fish hooking of distal ureter is bph what is this what is the structure guys can you identify this structure here what is this thing that you are seeing on this radiograph, abdominal radiograph? Anybody can identify this uh, stunt here? What do you think is this stunt? This is DJ stunt, right? Double J stunt. So you can see a coiling here in the kidney and a coiling here in the bladder. So this is double J stunt, right? In patients with renal calculi to drain the hydronephrosis and also to improve the peristalsis to expel the stones, we put this DJ stone, right? So DJ stent so to help you relieve the hydronephrosis in your patients. Okay. Bladder calculi is more lamellated. A speculated appearance like this is seen with Jackstone calculi. And if you see a popcorn calcification in the pelvis, especially in a postmenopausal female with chronic pelvic pain, and the pelvic radiograph shows a popcorn appearance. Please think of a calcified fibroid also. Calcified fibroid also. So please remember a normal vesicle calculus, a regular vesicle calculus will show laminated or onion peel like appearance like this. A jackstone calculus is more speculated. A popcorn appearance on a pelvic radiograph, especially postmenopausal female with pelvic pain, also think of calcified fibroid. But if you see popcorn appearance on the iliac bone, on the, you know, flat bones, think of a flat bone tumor, chondrosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, right? And I told you, a fetal skull-like calcification, if the bladder wall gets calcified and it appears like a fetal skull, this will be seen with cystosomia. This is a skull-like calcification and a risk of squamous cell cancer is seen with cystosomia. So, squamous cell cancer of the bladder and skull-like calcification of the bladder. Remember SSS, skull-like calcification of the bladder and squamous cell cancer of the bladder are features associated with cystosomiasis. When we have trauma to the spine, especially to the sacral segments, when you have a grossly distended bladder with diverticula, you get a Christmas tree appearance or grossly distended bladder with diverticula that is called as Christmas tree or a pine tree appearance of the bladder. This is neurogenic bladder. If you have the bladder being compressed from outside by a hematoma or by lymph nodes, it gives a tear-shaped bladder. So a tear-shaped or a pear-shaped bladder is any extrinsic compression, either by a pelvic lymph nodes or a you know Hodgkin's lymphoma in the pelvis or any hematoma inside the pelvis after trauma, which is compressing the bladder. You get a tear-shaped or pear-shaped bladder. Whenever you have a bladder with posterior valves, so imagine there is a posterior valve. Because of the posterior urethral valve, there is a distended bladder and the posterior urethra is dilated, giving a keyhole appearance. So, keyhole appearance is a feature of posterior urethral valve. Generally, it will be a child boy, okay? So, it will occur exclusively in boy. These are posterior urethral valves. Thimble bladder, we learnt a small atrophic non-calcific bladder. This is TB, okay? Non-calcific low volume bladder. This is thimble bladder. So, these are the different shapes of the bladder. So once again, skull-like calcification of the bladder, cystosomiasis, neurogenic bladder, grossly distended bladder with diverticulum, that would be your neurogenic bladder. A teardrop or, you know, a pear-shaped bladder would be extrinsic compression. Keyhole appearance, posterior urethral valve, right? Thimble bladder is TB. Can you tell me this thing, guys? There is a child with weak abdominal musculature. You are seeing there is herniation of bubble loops on the radiograph. And on MCU, you can see there is reflux back into the ureter. So, there is bilateral VUR, there is patient with bilateral cryptorchidism and also there is weak abdominal musculature. Anybody? Can you tell me what this could be? A child with weak abdominal musculature, bilateral cryptorchidism and bilateral VUR. Very good, Titraj. This is classic prune belly syndrome. This is prune belly syndrome, right? So, don't miss this image. You will get this clinical picture also and the uh, image showing you the VUR also. So, this would be prune belly syndrome. Good. Next.
very good Keshwardhan. Next, now imagine there is a trauma patient with a pelvic trauma and uh, you are having that patient has no bladed extraurethral meatus, that is there is not a urethral injury. But on foleys, there is minimal urine collected in the urine bag, okay, in the uro bag, there is very less urine collected. So, but there is no bladder extraurethral meatus. So, you are suspecting bladder injury. And bladder injuries, they can be intraperitoneal or extraperitoneal. So, when you put a foleys and you are putting contrast inside the bladder, if the contrast is leaking in between the bubble loops in the peritoneal folds like this. So, if there is contrast extravasation between bubble loops and into the peritoneal folds, this is intraperitoneal bladder rupture. Intraperitoneal bladder rupture. But if you see that the contrast from the bladder is leaking only in the perineum and giving a classic molar tooth sign, you are getting a molar tooth sign with the contrast pulling in the perineum. This is a extra peritoneal bladder rupture. Extra peritoneal bladder rupture. So there is an intra peritoneal bladder rupture and an extra peritoneal bladder rupture. It's simple. So the bladder is lined by peritoneum only on its upper part on the superior surface. So you can have either an intraperitoneal rupture or an extraperitoneal rupture. An intraperitoneal rupture will cause the contrast to come in the peritoneal folds, right, in the pouch of Douglas, in between the bowel loops, right, in the peritoneal folds and between the bowel loops, that is intraperitoneal. But if the contrast comes only in the perineum, giving a molar tooth appearance, that would be your extraperitoneal bladder rupture. So you have an intraperitoneal and an extraperitoneal bladder rupture. Next. Let us look at few more images in the uro part. Now the urethra. So we started with the kidney, then the ureter, right? We talked about maiden based deformity. We talked about fish hooking of the right mid ureter, all of that. We went on to bladder. We talked about the shapes of the bladder and all. Finally, we are coming to the urethra. So look at the image here. This is a young male with STDs, with history of STDs, or he had a history of a faulty catheterization, a previous faulty catheterization. Now, he is having narrow stream of urine. So, there was uh, untrained nurse during Foley's catheterization, the patient developed hematuria. Few weeks later, now he is developing narrow stream of urine. What do you think is this? What do you think is this? So, you can see here at the level of the bulba urethra, you are seeing narrowing. This is urethral stricture. This is urethral stricture. Please remember the most common site is bulba urethra. Most common site is bulba urethra. Now, look at another question. There is a male with post white dribbling of urine. So, this patient is complaining that after urination, he still has post white dribbling. So, when we are doing a contrast study, right, there is a catheter and you are injecting the contrast. You see that the contrast is coming into an outpouching, which is continuation with the lumen of the ureter. So, this is what is urethral diverticulum. It is not a stricture, it is diverticulum. Now here you have a patient with an RTA and he is having blood at extraneurethral meatus, a cyclist, straddle injury, blood extraneurethral meatus, strongly suspect urethral trauma. You are seeing there is extra or leaking of the contrast from the urethra. So this is urethral trauma. So that is how you have a urethral stricture, urethral diverticulum and a urethral trauma with a relevant clinical history. Please keep these images in mind. Now please look at this image. This is the bladder, this is the posterior urethra, and this is the anterior urethra. And the patient is actually voiding, you can see the patient urinating. This is MCU, micturating cystourethrography. Micturating cystourethrography, you are seeing the bladder and the urethra, cystourethrography. Also called as voiding cystourethrography, so MCU or voiding cystourethrography. MCU or voiding cystourethrography is useful for two important conditions. Remember, it is an investigation of choice for posterior valves. So, young boy with narrow stream of urine, congenitally, right, the posterior valve, the posterior is better seen by micturation cystoretrography. It is also the investigation of choice for vesicouretric reflux, vesicouretric reflux. But look at this image. Here, you are seeing a syringe or a catheter that will be seen there at the external urethral meatus. And through that, the contrast is injected into the anti urethra. You will see the anti urethra better. This is the curved area is the bulbar. This is spinal urethra and you are not seeing much of posterior urethra or the bladder. You are not seeing a very minimal amount of it. So, this is what is RGU. So, retrograde, you are pushing it retrograde, urethrography, only urethrography. So, 
antiurethra is seen better. So antiurethra is seen better by RGU, posterurethra is seen better by MCU. RGU is the investigation of choice for urethral trauma. So whenever you have a cyclist with, uh, you know, uh, straddle injury, with blood external urethral meatus, you are suspecting urethral trauma, Just look for the, you know, RGU to be done first, right? Whenever the abdomen is soft, there is no urge to urinate. First, get an RGU done before you put Foley's catheter. Foley's is contraindicated, right? So, Foley's would be contraindicated when you are suspecting urethral trauma. First, do RGU and identify if there is urethral trauma. If there is urethral trauma, you will not do Foley's. You would keep a suprapubic cystostomy. So, important to get an RGU done. And the investigation of choice for urethral strictures also. So, for urethral strictures, because I told you it is in the bulbar urethra, the anti urethra, bulbar and penile are called as anti urethras. So, to look at anti urethra, to look at urethral strictures and urethral trauma. So, remember these two important conditions for RGU. So, two conditions for MCU, two conditions for RGU, very important for your exam. For post urethral valve and for vesicular urethral reflux, go for MCU. For urethral trauma, for urethral strictures, go for RGU. Right? So, this is about that. Let me see if you can answer these questions. Few important questions. I hope you will answer them now. A 50 year old male complains of painless hematuria. CCT is done and there's a lesion in the kidney. What do you think is this? So I hope you can identify this easily. This is again a RCC, heterogeneous enhancement, right? Heterogeneous enhancement with hematuria, right? So whenever you see irregular heterogeneous enhancement, think of RCC. This is Oncocytoma, you are seeing a stellate scar. This is fat containing. Fat is black on CT. You compare it with the subcutaneous fat. It is black on CT. So, this is subcutaneous, similar to subcutaneous fat. This is angiomyolipoma. Angiomyolipoma. But look here, this is a well defined lesion which is different in density from the subcutaneous fat. So, it has a Hounsfield unit of 0, right? It is different from the subcutaneous fat. So, this is fluid containing. So, this is renal cyst. So, renal cyst. So, angiomyolipoma will be similar to this of the subcutaneous fat. And the renal cyst will be slightly, you know, fluid containing. That will be Hounsfield unit of 0. Here, the fat, what is the Hounsfield unit of fat? Fat has Hounsfield unit of minus 50 to minus 100. Hounsfield. Water would have, fluid would have a standard reference value of 0, right? So, 0 is for fluid. So, they may give you Hounsfield unit or they will give you the image compared with the subcutaneous fat. If it is similar to subcutaneous fat, it is fat containing, angiomyolipoma. If it is not that black, it is fluid containing, it is renal cyst, okay? Next. I hope, no, we have completed Euro also properly. Compatible with that? Shall we just finish X-ray also? Let us just quickly finish x-rays, right? So, let us start with the x-rays. All of you are comfortable, all of you here? Okay. Let's start with the first one, few mammography images. Where do you see this cluster of microcalcification? Where do you see this cluster of microcalcification? This is suggestive of a ductal carcinoma in situ. So, this is ductal carcinoma in situ, right? Cluster of microcalcification. Remember, a breast within breast appearance, this is suggestive of a fibroadenolipoma, also called as breast hematoma. Breast hematoma. And a popcorn appearance like this, this is a involuted involuted fibroadenoma, which is nothing but a BIRATS2 lesion, a benign lesion, right? So, this is involuted fibroadenoma showing a popcorn calcification. Let me do the popcorn calcification, popcorn calcification on chest x-ray. This is suggestive of pulmonary amartoma. Popcorn appearance on MAMO we learnt was fibroadenoma. A popcorn appearance on MRI brain like this, a vascular lesion, this is cavernous angioma. So, cavernous angioma is on MRI brain. So, on a chest x-ray is pulmonary hematoma. On mammography is fibroadenoma. On MRI brain is cavernous angioma. A popcorn appearance on iliac bone, this is a flat bone tumor, chondrosarcoma. 
and on the pelvic radiograph postmenopausal female right think of calcified fibroid calcified fibroid right so these are some important uh, points about popcorn calcifications you need to remember them next this is a favorite for the examiner please remember your larynx continues as trachea in the larynx we have vocal cords in the larynx we have the vocal cords so whenever the coin enters the trachea it has to enter in a sagittal plane like this it cannot enter in a coronal plane if it is going in the coronal plane like this that means it is in the esophagus esophagus is muscular distendable tube but for trachea it will only be in a sagittal view on the frontal radiograph so if it is in a coronal plane it is in the esophagus if it is in the sagittal plane it is in the trachea and if it is on the frontal radiograph it is in a sagittal plane when you look at on a lateral radiograph you will see full on in the tracheal lucency but if it is coronal like this when you look on a lateral view you will see only the slit right posterior to the tracheal lucency so that is how you identify whether it is in the esophagus or whether it is in the trachea just remember this point and think how it would appear on the frontal radiograph how it would appear on the lateral radiograph if it is in the esophagus and if it is asymptomatic wait and watch if it is symptomatic it is causing any problems to the patient right there is dysphagia there is difficulty swallowing or anything you will remove it by esophagoscopy a coin in trachea is removed by bronchoscopy but if it is button battery even though it is asymptomatic if you see this step down it is not a coin when you see that step down right that is a generally a button battery that you have so when you see a button battery remove immediately when it is in the esophagus right so it is very alkaline it causes esophageal erosions so button battery you should remove immediately so keep this in mind a coin in the esophagus will be on a frontal radiograph will be in a coronal plane on a lateral radiograph will appear like a slit like posterior to the tracheal lucency remove it by esophagoscopy remove by bronchoscopy when it is in the trachea and a button battery in the esophagus should be removed immediately next some important radiographs will compare and will revise them a cardiac pacemaker will have two thin electrodes one in the right atrium one in the right ventricle so small endings will be seen one in the right atrium one in the right ventricle so two thin electrodes in the right atrium and right ventricle whereas an icd right a implantable cardioverter defibrillator would have thicker coils a single lead with thick coils this would be icd so differentiate how an icd appears and how a cardiac pacemaker appears and to know their integrity whether they are in the correct location or not we go for chest x ray and what is contraindicated mri is a contraindication for these conditions so please remember to know the integrity of cardiac pacemaker or implantable cardioverter defibrillator what investigation we do chest x ray and uh, what is contraindicated mri is contraindicated now look at this image here you are seeing a calcific you know a prosthetic heart wall that you are seeing and uh, this heart wall is a mitral wall so this calc prosthetic heart wall how do you identify whether it is mitral wall aortic wall tricuspid wall or pulmonary wall to understand that just remember so imagine this is the heart this is the left auricle or the left hilum just near the left hilum you can see the left hilum the left auricle from the left auricle to the right cardiophrenic angle this is the diaphragm this is the heart this is the cardiophrenic angle so you draw an imaginary line from the left auricle to the right cardiophrenic angle if you see a valve below this imaginary line so you draw a line here like this if it is below it it is mitral valve if it is above this imaginary line it is aortic valve so from the left auricle to the right cardiophrenic angle draw an imaginary line if it is seen below it it is mitral wall if it is seen above it it is aortic wall a wall which is more towards the right and inferiorly this is tricuspid obviously we know tricuspid wall is on the right side so more towards the right and inferiorly the more superiorly and to the left this is pulmonary wall so if tomorrow they mention it as a b c d and give you and ask you to identify which wall is given remember what i have told you now the first draw an imaginary line from the left auricle to right cardiophrenic angle the valve which is below this imaginary line is the mitral wall the wall that is above this imaginary line is the aortic wall 
the one which is more inferiorly and to the right is tricuspid, superiorly and to the left is your pulmonary wall. Here you can see this is the breast shadow, you are not seeing the breast shadow here. So this is a left sided master, I hope you can identify this breast shadow we are talking about. So this is the left sided mastectomy you are having in the patient. So this is the left sided mastectomy in the patient or congenitally it could be Poland syndrome which is a mastia with absent pectoral muscles, right. So just remember these you know, radiographs. Sometimes they can give you this patient with trauma who is having multiple rib fractures and they say there is paradoxical movement of the chest wall. A paradoxical movement is movement inward during inspiration, outward during expiration. This would be flail chest, right? So this is flail chest. So uh, multiple rib fractures with paradoxical movement of the chest wall. Some important radiographs will be asked. Occipitofrontal view is Caldwell view. And the Caldwell view we all know is for frontal sinus and for superior or vital fissure. Look at superior or vital fissure and for frontal sinus we will use occipitofrontal. Occipitomental view with closed mouth is water's view. And water's view is for maxillary sinus and also for orbital floor. Orbital floor. Right, so orbital floor fractures, the teardrop fractures can also be seen by water's view. To look at orbital floor also, we go for water's view. So maxillary sinus as well as orbital floor and it is a closed mouth. Open mouth, remember P for P. Perry is open, open mouth, right, is Perry view. So same, occipital mental with open mouth is Perry view, closed mouth is water's view, okay. So open mouth is Perry view. Now, how to identify them on the exam? If they do not mention any view, they do not say any occipitofrontal or occipitomental, just the radiograph they have given and you have to identify what sinus is seen by this view or what is this view. So imagine this given, they have given you this radiograph. You can see the mentum, you can see there is a closed mouth. More importantly, you can see this is the petrous ridge, this bony ridge that I am marking here. This is the petrous ridge. This is the maxillary sinus. If you see the petrous ridge below the maxillary sinus, this is water's view, petrous ridge below the maxillary sinus. But if you see the petrous ridge overlapping the maxillary, this is maxillary sinus, it is overlapping the maxillary sinus. A petrous ridge overlapping the maxillary sinus below the orbit, just below the orbit overlapping the maxillary sinus, this is your Caldwell view. So how to differentiate Caldwell view and water's view? A petrous ridge below the maxillary sinus is water's view. The maxillary sinus will be seen clearly. Petrous ridge overlapping the maxillary sinus. The maxillary sinus will not be seen clearly. It is just below the orbit overlapping the maxillary sinus. That would be your Caldwell view. So please understand how the petrous ridge is. Let me just show you the image again. So look at the bony ridge that you are seeing there. Right. So let me show you. I hope try to concentrate on the maxillary sinuses. Try to concentrate on the maxillary sinus. You can see that there is a bony ridge overlapping here. Right, so it is a Caldwell view and here the maxillary sinus are clearly seen. That is the reason we use water's view for maxillary sinus. You see the petrous ridge below the maxillary sinus, this is water's view. So be careful on the day of exam which view is given to you, right. So whether it is water's view or a Caldwell view. Water's view is for maxillary sinus and Caldwell view is only to look at frontal sinus, not the maxillary sinus. These are important again. Look at here. In the patient you are seeing a tube with the trachea, this is the endotracheal tube. This is the bifurcation of the trachea, this is the tip of the endotracheal tube. Normally this tip should be more than 5 centimeters above the carina. So this is the bifurcation of the carina. A normal endotracheal tube should, the tip of the endotracheal tube should be more than 5 centimeters above the carina. This is a post intubation x-ray given to you and the patient's oxygenation is not improving. So they gave you this radiograph and they say this is post intubation chest x-ray, patient's oxygenation is not improving, what is the likely diagnosis? Is it pleural effusion on the left side, is it right pneumothorax or is it left lung collapse or is it faulty insertion? If you see the tip of the endotracheal tube, if you see the tip of the endotracheal tube, you can see it has gone into the right main bronchus. It is not above the carina, it has gone into the right main bronchus. Try to look at the radiograph carefully. 
right don't uh, you know i hope you can see the tip of the endotracheal tube which has gone into the right main bronchus so this would be faulty insertion this is faulty insertion of the endotracheal tube faulty insertion of the endotracheal tube and this is again very very important you will be given with a neonate a newborn child with frothing right and you will be shown these radiographs where you are seeing there is coiling of the nasogastric tube so whenever you see a coiling of nasogastric tube so if you put try to put a nasogastric tube and if it is getting coiled like this that means there is a tracheoesophageal fistula so this indicate there is tracheoesophageal fistula so a tracheoesophageal fistula a distal tracheoesophageal fistula which is communicating with the trachea because it is communicating with the trachea here you will see lot of gas coming into the abdomen so you will have the upper part showing coiling and in the abdomen you will see this distension this is distal tracheal fistula where you have the connection with the trachea so air comes in the abdomen so that is how you have your tracheal fistulas so coiling of nasogastric tube is also an important radiograph that you should remember this has been asked in recent exam in india so please remember this when you have a coiling of nasogastric tube right in a new nate with frothing think of tracheal fistula they gave a radiograph and you have to identify it as a tracheal fistula so that is important lastly look at this two important parameters right that we need to understand with x rays one is kilo voltage peak and milliampere second so when we start the x rays in in the patient when we focus the x rays we change two parameters one is called kvp one is called mas what will happen if you increase kvp what will happen if you increase mas let us understand these things kvp will increase the energy of x rays directly proportional to energy that means that is the quality of x rays so energy or quality of x rays is increased by kvp it is directly proportional to penetration power more the more is the energy more is the penetration of x rays right so obviously more energy more penetration but it is inversely proportional to contrast inversely proportional because if it is more penetrated even the ribs get penetrated even the ribs will appear black right so what is contrast differentiating white and black so lungs should be black and ribs should be white but if you have more energy of x rays more penetration even the ribs will appear black so you will have poor contrast so please remember this kvp is directly proportional to energy of x rays directly proportional to penetration power but inversely proportional to contrast so to improve contrast to improve contrast you have to decrease kvp not in, it is inversely proportional you have to decrease kvp this is the chief factor that you have to change the chief factor that you have to change coming to mas mas is directly proportional to number it is not related to energy of x it is increased to number how many x rays will come number right so it is the quantity of x rays that is decided by mas mas decides the quantity of x rays more x rays fall the x ray film becomes more black so you'll have more blackening of the film more x rays fall on the film more black the film becomes but it will not change the penetration power so the lungs will be black but the ribs will be white so the lungs will become more black and the ribs will remain white so it is directly proportional to contrast so once again avp is directly proportional to energy of x rays directly proportional to penetration power of x rays and inversely proportional to contrast mas is directly proportional to number of x rays the number of you know uh, x rays means more blackening of the film and directly proportional to contrast so to improve contrast you can also increase mas but single best answer should be decreasing kvp okay so you can do both to improve contrast and that is the reason in mammography why are we able to see the breast cancer in mammography that is also an x ray procedure but not seeing that on a chest x ray of the same female why are we able to see this lesion in the can breast cancer on a mammography but not on a chest radiograph of the same female it, both of them are using x rays only what is the technical difference that we have in mammography there is decreased kvp because we don't have to penetrate any ribs any uh, scalp uh, scapula right it's just a breast image so you don't have to have lot of penetration so you don't have lot of kvp to give and what else you can do you increase mas so please remember mammography differs from chest x ray technically in that in mammography you have decrease kvp and increase ms decrease kvp and increase ms 
Now let's try to look at this question. Try to answer this question. An industrial worker was admitted to the hospital after injury to the eye following his work with hammer and chisel. Foreign bodies were suspected to be impacted in his eye. Which of the following investigation would be detrimental for this patient? So look at this. There is an industrial worker who is having injury to the eye, right? And he is, was seen working with hammer and chisel, a foreign body suspected, which investigation would be detrimental? Obviously, right? So whenever you're having a hammer and chisel, you're suspecting a intraocular metallic foreign body. Intraocular metallic foreign body. So whenever you have an intraocular metallic foreign body, what is the investigation of choice, guys? What is the investigation of choice for intraocular metallic foreign body? CT scan. And what is contraindicated? Remember, MRI is an absolute contraindication. So he asked detrimental. That means what is to be avoided? What is to be avoided? MRI should be avoided. Okay, so that should be your correct answer here. Right? So please remember what is what which of the following among the investigation is the detrimental he asked, right? So please understand. Detrimental means which is contraindicated. MRI should be the answer. Investigation of choice is CT, but MRI is detrimental or MRI should be contraindicated or avoided. Are we clear with this? So I think I'll stop it here and I hope uh, you enjoyed the discussion so far and uh, I tried to see that uh, you know all the chapters that we have covered so far. Uh, you know the concepts are clearer and much easier to revise we'll see if we can you know plan a further session for you guys again okay thank you so much and uh, please uh, let me know if you could uh, you know follow this session i'll try to talk to the team if we can have a follow up session on this okay is this comfortable guys all of you right any queries you have with me or you you can all the detailed lectures of all the topics okay including the quick revision programs are available in the Dr. Rails app and you can you know connect to me on my insta id Dr. Khalil 999 and uh, I'll be happy to help you all and I'll see if we can have a follow up session right. Thank you so much guys. You want to listen more I can try for a next session but I hope it's 10 11 now. So if you're all comfortable, I can try to extend it or else I'll plan a follow-up session. Okay, so don't worry with it. I can complete. We'll follow our part two of it, right, where we try to, you know, do neuro and GI and other topics if you want. Just, uh, you know, let me talk to the team and schedule it. Okay. Thank you.